Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello, you're on. We can hear you. Hello. Fantastic. Great. Virtual background. <laughs> yeah. The original one, one wasn't uh, that decorative, so I made it this way. <clears throat> Yes, can hear you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Bastian. Ach, der Michael. Der Striebe Michael. Servus, how are you doing? Ah, oh, fine. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm super. I did not get Corona yet. Hey. <laughs> uh, I had, have had the uh, my, my sixth or so employer sponsored corona test last week so i think i'm I think i'm good doing okay okay i did not have a single test i was just one time in quarantine for just to be sure because my son had contact in the kindergarten but we are all safe we are all nothing so <laughs> glad to hear it well and germany also doesn't have 120,000 new cases every year right every day every day every day <laughs> Yes, that's right. <clears throat> oh, well. So Germans and far and large are doing the right thing and are wearing a mask and such. Uh, we hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin is here too. Good to see you, Kevin. How's it going? Uh, it's going all right. How are you? Yep. <clears throat> Tell you what, when I'm looking at Jan Philip's uh, um, profile picture, I'm 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 getting, I'm beginning to miss the uh, the the work meetings I used to have at, at TU München, and getting to use the slide to go back down to the lobby. For those of you who don't know, uh, TU München has as the computer science department has its own building, and it's fairly substantial, fairly modern, and fairly fairly pretty, um, and it has a slide that goes through the middle um how you call that atrium that allows you to slide down from the top floor all the way down to the bottom i think it was put in as as an uh, emergency escape route but that's not how it's being used <laughs> Bastian, what are your experiences? Did everyone make it to the sessions, the sessions today? Or well, is it possible that people are a bit late? Um, well, since we, on, we only had um, one session so far, um, one data point does not make a complete sample. 
but um, I, we we started comparatively on time in the previous workshop, and um, we had about thirteen people of twenty one or so who registered. And registrations for this is an exact science because uh, you know every every conference session is free or part of the of of the of the fee that they paid, so they can do any or none, right? So uh, right, right. I say, whenever you're ready, whenever you're comfortable, take it away. Okay, thank you. Yep. I'm also co-host here, so I can, you know, do things for you if you if you can't. That's <clears> nice. <throat> uh, Bre breakout sessions, such things. We didn't plan with with breakout sessions, um, but just in case we'd like to share a video, maybe. It okay. depends on how the people will arrive. And if they will arrive, or if they have any difficulties. Okay. Yep. As you wish. Um, showing okay. videos over Zoom is like a. I would. I would caution. <laughs> okay. But, but there's such, such if it's on YouTube or something like that, I would. I would recommend we do Watch Together, uh, which is a website where you can just you know um, paste the YouTube link and then we can all go to the to the website and then. Yeah, that, that have... may be a better experience, right? As sharing videos with Zoom can be tricky, especially if you also want to share the audio and not just the video. <laughs> okay. Because that usually yes. involves doing some additional configurations, ticking some checkboxes or something like that. <laughs> so I pasted the link to watch together in the in the Zoom chat. Um, so if you want to create a watch together room and then link that link to the room with the video in it, then that will be in, if we want to do a, um, a video, this might, might be the best option for you. Okay. Jeroen, since it's signed here, can you hear me? I can hear you, um, yes. Yeah, great. Uh, so it's just a quick check. Uh, so Paul uh, will join us. So do you know if uh, he said- uh, Paul to told us that he would be ill, oh, but no. Marcello would be presenting instead. So, okay. but I didn't see Marcello. Uh, not, I didn't see him yet. So I hope he will make it uh, within the next few minutes, within the next 50 minutes or so. Um, if not, we have to react to adapt, right? I'm not sure what, what's happened to him. Okay, so it's uh, half past one. We should start, I think. It's our time. Um, hello and welcome. Here's WEED 2020, our first international workshop on essence in education and training. Thanks for joining us today. Um, this workshop is for everyone interested in utilizing Essence, uh, the OMG standard, uh, in education and training. Um, thanks to the CSEENT organizers for having us today. My name is Joran Pieper, and I'm one of the organizers. With me are Arne, I can see you, Arne, right now, uh, Kendra, Luis Fernando, and Michael. You'll meet them throughout the workshop and behind the scenes at the chat. Uh, we're looking forward to spending the next four hours with you. And let's have a look at our schedule so everyone knows what to expect. Use my screen. I hope so. Do you see the screen? Please give me a short sign. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I just see all the participants of the chat. Okay, let's have a look at our schedule. Here it is. Um, we are uh, covering three essential areas when it comes to using Essence in education and training. We do it in three special sessions. After a short keynote, 
um, we will start immediately with the first session. Our first session is uh, covering game, uh, sorry, is covering the introducing of Essence in software engineering courses and project work. Um, and we've got two presentations there. Our second session is addressing game-based learning of Essence. Um, this session will start at quarter past three. Um, and the third session, our last session, is addressing the essential, essentialization of software engineering practices and methods. This session uh, starts quarter past four. And we will wrap up our workshop at quarter past five and finish it at half past five. In our workshop, we are not fully following the flip format of the conference. So even if you could not watch all videos or read all papers uh, upfront, uh, you will be able to follow us and participate in discussions. Uh, we adapted to the new virtual format and had to cut out some initially planned activities, but we have generously scheduled time for your questions and discussions. Um, interaction is what this workshop is about, and we hope for vivid discussions um, after the presentations. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. While presentations are running, uh, write your questions in your, our corresponding uh, Slack channel called workshop weed uh, at the CSEENT workspace. And after each presentation, the chair will open uh, the discussion and feel free to ask your questions there. Okay, any questions so far to our schedule? No. So let's start with our short keynote. Um, as a backup, we have a recorded ve version of it. Um, Paul McMahon provided it to us. And um, our initially invited keynote speaker can't be with us today. Uh, as Ivo let us know, he's still recovering from COVID-19. Our best wishes are with you and your family, Ivar. But we are pleased to win Paul McMahon at such short notice um, to step in. Paul joined the efforts to develop Essence, the standard right from the start. And he was involved in creating Essence and provides decades of experience to help companies uh, build systems and solve their problems. Paul titled his talk, Essence, an industry perspective on what we should be teaching our next generation of software engineers at the university. So since I can't see Paul here right now, um, I would like to use the recorded version of his talk that Paul provided to us. I'll paste the link to the YouTube video into the chat channel so we can use the process that Bastian uh, described to us. So we can watch uh, his talk together over there. So if you paste it into the, into the uh, Zoom session or into the Slack channel, the YouTube link directly, then we will each watch it by ourselves. But if you create on Watch Together a room and then link the video in there, then we can go to the Watch Together channel and be together in the same, and then you can pause and stop and things like that. This sounds, to you. sounds great too. Um, <clears throat> okay. Just creating a room on Watch Together. Not sure why I see a llama here. Uh, 
Okay, I'm just sharing um, this room in our chat. Do you see the link? Oh no, this is this is the wrong link. Uh, this is not the room with watch together. That was the original YouTube link. There we go. Right. This is not what I'd like to share. Um, I think that's the default. Yeah. It seems that I'm not uh, able to insert. You can just here. put it into the search bar up here. Yeah, yeah, like I did. So. And... and then like so, how about that? Did that play for you guys? That looks good. Yes, this is Paul. Thank you, Basim.
Well, thank you, Paul. I think that's a great uh, setup for a workshop today, providing some insights and some food for thought. Um, Paul has some other commitments today, but he accepted to accompany us through the day uh, where it is possible to him. So if you've got any questions for Paul, please write them in our chat, uh, Slack channel. Um, we will forward questions to Paul. Uh, ask in that Slack channel if Paul is not available at that time. Do you want me to, to post his keynote yes. on the website? Um, sorry, I, I, pardon, I didn't uh, catch what you said. So I, I can I can add his keynote onto the website such that yeah, it's a prominent yeah, video, yeah. right? Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Um, for everyone interested in how Essence was developed uh, and how things evolved, uh, please have a look at Paul's book, Shy Boys. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and if you'd like to meet Paul again, you may join our next meeting at the Essence Education Forum at the end of November. More on that later in our workshop. I think it's now time to start our first session. I give the floor over to the chair of this session, Anne. I see that Marce Marcello uh, just arrived. So he should be available too, right? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, perfect. So can you hear me well? Uh, just check my, my microphone. So glad uh, especially to, to see Marcelo here because uh, we I saw you in uh, Slack and uh, yeah. Uh, it's a bit strange that you do not see the the, the, the link, but uh, yeah, that, that's what now it seems. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, then thanks uh, so much, uh, Joran, for the introductions. And, and uh, I need to also mention his huge efforts uh, behind uh, putting and uh, coordinating and putting all together so we can have the workshop today. So it's uh, uh, really the, the, the most of the, the, the I mean, uh, credit should come to him. And um, yes, yeah, so um, my name is uh, Ang Nguyen Duc. So um, yeah, just uh, briefly about myself and then uh, we go through the agenda of uh, the sessions because we already a bit late. Yeah, my name is Ang Nguyen Duc. So I'm working now as an uh, associate professor at the University of Southeastern Norway. I'm uh, locating now in uh, Oslo. And uh, I started to work with uh, Essence since 2016 uh, with uh, Professor Pekka Abrahamson. And uh, also involved in uh, Eva's uh, book project. And uh, yeah, so nowadays uh, it looks like this. Uh, I think it's uh, maybe many of you have a copy of this already, yeah. But uh, I am born in a quite early phase uh, when we exchange a lot of like uh, doc uh, versions and we discuss a lot. So I, I work in the exercise track and we actually had uh, a lot of discussion with uh, Paul. He's the core, uh, core chair of the exercise sessions. Uh, we discussed a lot because uh, he had the more uh, practical experience. He do more with the company consultancies uh, why uh, Pekka and I, we, we more into teaching and actually we applied the uh, essence to a, a software engineering uh, class context. So we have 400 students and we try to teach them uh, essence. So uh, I have some to share, but I also like a lot to hear from both of uh, our presenters today. Uh, so we will have two uh, presentations. First one uh, uh, entitled uh, teaching the essence of uh, software development and uh, the second one, uh, uh, project oriented cost of uh, software engineering based on essence. So I'm really happy to see both of our uh, speakers are uh, here already. And um, so uh, just a bit um, uh, guideline here. Um, so uh, we belong to the CSE and T conference, but we're not really following the flip uh, uh, conference format. And uh, we have both we present uh, live uh, their uh, papers here. So please aware we have uh, maybe maximum 15 minutes. 
uh, but maybe you, you can make it a bit shorter and then uh, there will be time for some questions. Uh, after that, uh, we have the uh, overall discussion for the sessions, but mainly to discuss both of the papers uh, in a, a, a broader context. And uh, yeah, and then after that, uh, we have uh, five minutes maybe for the session uh, summary. And uh, already, uh, if you watch or you listen already to, to one of the talks, uh, you can uh, type in your questions or your comments in the chat box here. I mean, the easiest way is that you, you try and you can chat already in the, the, the chat box in Zoom. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have Slack as well, but uh, well, uh, it can save time to, to just focus on one tune here. Uh, yes. Uh, so before we start, uh, do you have any questions or comments? Actually, I might I might have a small one, and I'm really sorry if I'm if, if yes, I'm asking yes, this. So, I'm, I'm, yeah, we have question. Yes. Let me let me say again. I'm really really sorry for this question, but. Even after the your introduction, which was marvelous, and after the keynote, which was entertaining, I still don't know what essence is. Could you like in a sentence or two maybe say that I get a feeling why I should care about essence? So, but I still don't really know what that is. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so great. So, so, um, so I, I can just give a very like quick one two sentence summarize, and uh, I believe that Maslow will, will present it much better than uh, than what I can say. Uh, so yeah, uh, we so the according to Eva, we see uh, nowadays there are so many different uh, practice, uh, different uh, models, different process when talking about the software development methodologies. And uh, then he come up with a common language that helped to firstly be able to describe uh, different uh, methods, different uh, practices. And uh, we can use the language to, to not only to uh, compare, to discuss, but also to describe your own uh, way of working. Yeah? So, so yeah, so, so yeah, I, I think uh, maybe it's better that, that uh, we can uh, listen to Maslow for this, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, if, yeah. I may, if I may, uh, I had this uh, same question asked uh, several times. So for example, for, uh, by my uh, professor, uh, Paolo Ciancarini, which is, is not, it's not here today. And uh, I found really difficult to explain in, in a few sentences how, what essence really is. And I think there are several possible uh, definitions. Uh, I, there are two quick uh, ones that I uh, can try to, to, to tell you if you find them interesting. And one is uh, a meta language to describe the processes. This is uh, short. There should be the equivalent of UML for classes or similar things. And the other is uh, uh, a system to uh, expose, elicit uh, the status of a project. This is, uh, and the second one is actually the, the, the part that we are using now in our courses, which is, I don't know if, it, if, it, if it's good enough for, for, for you. Okay, well, thank you. That helps. If you say a system, I, pre I presume you mean systematic thing you do and not a software system or a hardware system that you can buy. Yes, it's uh, yeah, a non-physical system in, in general. Uh, in fact, uh, the fact that it lacks some physical equivalent is probably one of his uh, problems, in, in my view, but uh, we'll probably get to that. But, yeah. So it's a yeah. philosophy, really. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. so, yeah. <laughs> so we were looking forward to, to Maslow's presentation. But I see also Kevin uh, raised a hand. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, you have a question as well.
Yeah, Kevin, if you want to to have some comments, you can just unmute yourself. Are you, are you talking to me? I, I don't yeah. have, I don't have a hand raised. Sorry. No. Okay. Yeah. So great. Uh, so then uh, I I leave uh, the stage to Marcelo. So you want to. Uh, share your screen, maybe. And yes, I'll try. I'll try to. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, I can stop the other ones. So I think this one should be. Should do. Okay. Hopefully. Uh, uh, just a, a notice. Uh, I I will show the the icon that I. Uh, when I think that we, you, you may have uh, to wrap up uh, your presentations. So okay. The time limitation. Okay. Yes. So hello, everybody. I'm, it's really sad that I, I'm, we've not been able to be together uh, in, uh, in person, but you know we live in strange and dangerous times. So I think uh, this will not happen in the foreseeable future for some time. So... Um, uh, something about myself. Uh, my name is Marcello Missiroli. I mostly teach computer science uh, in high school in, in Modena, Italy. I also uh, teach uh, software engineering at the, at the University of Modena. And I also am teaching assistant in software engineering at the University of Bologna. Uh, I've been working uh, uh, with the SS group for uh, some time. I don't recall exactly how, how long, possibly one, two years. Uh, and I've been operating with, with the group. Uh, so uh, we, uh, after just talking, I even started doing something. Uh, why? Why? Because um, there is an obvious uh, potential in essence in education. Uh, exactly like UML had a, a strong impact on how uh, programming is taught, uh, architecture is taught, uh, uh, software architecture is taught, I think this uh, might have the, a similar uh, influence because it has a visual impact, because it's both formal and clear, but also intuitive and in general is usable. So it uh, looks like a, a, a good idea. Uh, I think as of now, there are some problems. Uh, some are specific to, for example, the way uh, we teach things in Italy. Uh, Others are probably common to everyone. Uh, the first is obvious that it, it requires preparation. You can't really say, okay, today we start, uh, we change everything we've done up to now and we use exp um, Essence as a Course, a course book and throw everything out. Uh, we also in Italy have some specific uh, regulation that prohibits us to do so. So we have to change things uh, gradually. Uh, and in general, every, everyone teaches uh, uh, software engineering differently. So probably uh, even uh, everyone should uh, cut, paste, uh, modify things according to its tastes and its needs. And the other thing is that we all need easy to use tools, okay, uh, in general. Uh, so what we started doing, we started first introducing Essence in our course. Uh, it's not a full blown uh, change of everything uh, on Essence, but we introduced some uh, several uh, aspects. Uh, we want to uh, try to uh, introduce, develop uh, some tools in, in the way we will see later. We are uh, suggesting, that means essentially forcing students to use Essence uh, uh, in our projects. And uh, we plan to evaluate our experience using uh, GQM uh, questions. And so what uh, did we in practice do? So uh, we in, introduce, try to introduce, will introduce, depends on, on the semester, some elements in, 
in the courses. Uh, the courses are very similar, both at the third year, though the, um, the, 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 the uh, subject change a little bit. Uh, as I said, changes in our courses must be gradual. As of now, the book is not our official course book, it's just a suggested reading. And uh, uh, specifically, specifically, we have uh, obviously make a general introduction to essence. Uh, we focus on Scrum Light, which is also the uh, method uh, proposed for students to develop their projects. We use some essence cards. Essentially, we are limiting at, uh, at the moment uh, uh, a strong use of user stories, uh, essence cards, and team cards during lectures. Uh, the general idea that the, the students look interested, but we are not sure exactly what they did really understand uh, until the end of the course. So when we get to the end. Specialized tools in general, not, which means uh, not programs using. Uh, mm, I, I think one thing is, uh, is missing and we are planning to, to, to work in on, on this uh, for uh, the semester of the next. Uh, we all started, uh, we all start teaching uh, uh, software engineering with the waterfall. It is old, it is, you know, uh, but is uh, the basis for everything because it introduces all the phases of, uh, of the development process and so on. But, uh, Describing waterfall with uh, just uh, essence at the moment is not so easy. So we are planning to uh, write something on it. And hopefully uh, we hope to receive an official recognition so that it becomes an official method, something called waterfall light. And if we have time, uh, possibly essentialize more methods like spiral, uh, uh, RUP, and, and et cetera. Um, then we are working on uh, games. Uh, games is very uh, um, uh, a broad, uh, a broad term. So it introduces serious games uh, or uh, um, games that are in part in practice part of the uh, of the methodology and not exactly less the same thing. So uh, we are introducing something about. Uh, uh, team self-evaluation based on the team card, essentially. Uh, evaluation of the backlog and, of course, which is, this is more obvious, uh, a strong use in, in retrospect. Uh, we are working on this right now. The essentialized e-tools is more com opera, complicated. I, I don't know why it stopped because there are Ah, because this is wrong. Okay, uh, this in practice is here. Okay. Uh, while uh, the problem is that currently there are no uh, mainstream uh, project management software that directly support essence. Uh, we all know that Jira is the most used tools, but also Visual Paradigm and uh, Tiger, which is open source uh, and is the one we use. Uh, they, in practice, uh, have uh, ignore at the, at, at the time, uh, ignore uh, essence. Uh, there are some tools uh, which we all know oh, oh, they're all free uh, and uh, at our disposal, but are not really uh, powerful and cannot be integrated into existing tools. So, uh, since our group uh, has developed its own uh, development environment named this year, yes, it's, it's, uh, only, it's fully open source software, aims to become a, a functional equivalent of, uh, of Jira, but uh, yeah, it's still far from it because it's not integrated and uh, uh, still has some rough edges. Uh, of course, it's not uh, essentialized at the moment. So we want to try to include some essential elements in the project management part, which is AIGA, uh, an open source uh, software clone of Trello, which you might have heard of. Uh, we ask, uh, strongly ask the student to use it. 
then collect productivity data and feedback on that. This is our current difficulty. Final part is uh, to force the essentialization of projects from uh, the student. So uh, since our course uh, requires a project, uh, we suggested uh, the use of essential aspect during uh, uh, the development, team building gains, status card and guides, uh, especially for retrospective, which are very now, and uh, status cards as uh, process monitors. Evaluation, uh, it's uh, the term has just started, so we are still far from it, but we plan to use a GQM approach uh, evaluate uh, things, especially uh, student uh, uh, feedback, and uh, on all uh, of the following uh, points, uh, adherence to the standard, integrability with existing tools, and usability, which is probably the weakest uh, problem. Uh, as of the teaching efficiency, we will use a similar approach and evaluate the perceived usefulness of essence elements and a holistic evaluation of changes with respect to the past year and the comparison, of course, of student to get how we are doing. So this is it. The, 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 the last slide has moved up, which is this one. So I think I am uh finish uh, uh, yeah thank you um marcelo yeah um very interesting uh, presentations and um so first i'd like to to give the stage uh if yeah uh, somebody have mm -hmm. questions here to marcelo mm -hmm. Uh, so in the meantime, I can uh, have my question first, maybe. Uh, so Marcelo, uh, it's a very interesting setting because uh, it's very similar to what we did uh, at um, our university here in Norway. Yeah, I wanted to talk yeah. about that too, but I couldn't come up with a question. <laughs> I was involved in that. Yeah, okay, maybe you can share your experience. Um, well, I'm a younger PhD student, so basically I only got to look at the data in retrospect uh, while uh, Anne and uh, my supervisor, Beck uh, Abrahamson, uh, were the ones actually teaching the course. But um, So I did help them write a paper about it. And um, so we had a large project-based course of some 100 student teams. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. wait, that's a bit too much for this. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, a uh, large project voice course. And um, uh, we, we felt that uh, the students felt that essence was a bit cumbersome. Basically, the learning was the issue. So you, you said so far that the students, um, uh, you, that you can't really tell what the students are really like thinking about it, that they seemed interested. I, I think that in our case, it was also the case that the, they weren't like actively disinterested in it, but that, that they also felt that it was a bit hard to grasp. So in analyzing the reports in retrospect, I felt that many of the student teams did not really understand the idea of essence, that they really got hung up on the some alphas or some practices that they did not grasp the idea. It was just a thing to model their way of working. Mm -hmm. So do, do you felt, so far, uh, do you feel that the students are having a hard time learning it or? Uh, um, we are essentially, telling them uh, just use the cards uh, and and let's see what happens this is at least uh, we are in the first uh, part of the project so uh, at first they didn't even know cast card existed then they found out that the card existed and they started using it and uh, for example i if i can i can probably uh, in in a few uh, moment uh, find out what they created. They created a sort of uh, a retrospective map with uh, several cards on uh, good things, uh, bad things, uh, uh, things to work about. So that is a general idea. I don't know. I shall 
to you, with you the, the idea that probably the general idea is not, they didn't get the general idea. So probably uh, they think, ah, oh, we must do this because they want us to do this. Uh, but the why still is, uh, they will learn probably in the future possibly uh, when they get to work. Uh, but uh, yes, okay. But there are many other things that we, we teach and they will learn later. So this might become one of them. Uh, so Marcelo, so uh, there are third year students in the bachelor program. So did they learn like waterfall, uh, scrum, uh, HI before? Uh, I, I didn't get exactly. Do you mean we taught? So, yeah, so in in your uh, in your course, hey, when they try with essence, so before that, did they learn already about like waterfall? Uh, well, it was very fast because uh, say we spoke about uh, this is waterfall, this uh, requirement is elicitation, this is uh, design, blah blah blah, and uh, in uh, in two lessons, so, uh, this uh, these are the agile methods. So. so uh, it was very fast. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what exactly they uh, got. So they got a, a classical introduction, and possibly we changed to a more uh, uh, modern agile approach. But it was uh, um, taught in uh, you know with lecture with uh, typical uh, methods. Uh, we didn't use uh, essence then, so we just used them uh, during the project. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, yes, so Gerard, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm from yeah industry, so to say, and uh, my experience is every development method has to be experienced and not to be taught because otherwise you don't understand it completely. Yeah, it's just bullshit wasting of time, in my opinion. You have to have some experience to really be able to understand why, for example, agile methods have such a huge uh, acceptance in industry. Um, I can't even imagine uh, teaching methods without being exposed to them. So is it in combination taught with some practical projects, whatever, or is it really um, an taught by uh, yeah, giving classical lectures um, okay, so uh, both. It, there is, uh, we started, uh, we are continuing doing classical lectures, but we also started in parallel the project and we, we forced them to, to develop the project in, uh, say, three sprints. So after each sprint, they had to present us something. So it is uh, practical in this. Uh, this okay. Uh, I might say that you're a, a little uh, optimistic uh, for uh, example, for, in Italy, Agile is not so widespread as you might think. There are many, many so, uh, okay. that are still very, very classical. I would Even say in, especially in, Munich, in Munich, I don't know any company who is not doing Agile anymore. Munich. So just to give <laughs> some, at least in the company where I am and um, we do now Agile for more than 20 years, so... Um, Same in New York. Yeah, okay. So I don't even um, accept classical waterfall-ish working at all anymore at industry. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't see it anymore. Uh, here it still happens, especially large companies like, you know, I don't know... Fiat, but they're doing uh, safe nowadays or whatever, these mm -hmm. kind of methods. I know, you, you know, but uh, they don't. <laughs> so. Yeah, but even larger companies in Munich, I would say, at least for new stuff, they are going away from old methods because they know that they won't succeed with them. Okay. In a way, I, for example, in my university in Modern, I, I started introducing Agile strongly three years ago before it was just... Uh, Okay, read this uh, and let's see what happens. So, mm -hmm. okay. 
And I thought Munich was late. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we also have a comment in the chat box from uh, uh, Timothy. Yeah. So yeah. So agree that uh, yeah, everything is need to be experienced and uh, yeah, and sharing the experience in Canada about how widespread HI is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <sighs> Yes. Uh, um, maybe uh, we may have some oh. more questions uh, and no. bring that to the uh, discussions uh, of decisions. And maybe now Hello. it's the time for for Dennis uh, to present his uh, paper. Then. Sorry, Partha here. I was just thinking if I could ask a quick question to Marcelo. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, hi, hi, Marcelo. Uh, very, very interesting topic. And uh, so this is Partha. I'm Partha Sarathuri. Uh, I'm from India. And I spent about 22, 23 years in industry. And then I'm back in academics. And I'm doing a full time PhD in Indian Statistical Institute in software engineering. Uh, don't ask me why, why the bug bit me, but we'll talk about another day, maybe, and maybe in the third session. But uh, I had one quick question, and as actually uh, what Muller said, uh, that was very interesting, because I worked both in PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting and IBM, and at times I have seen that people are kind of resorting to a, a interesting blend of you know agile and waterfall, while believing that's waterfall, right? Uh, agile rather, but again there are very interesting stories there, but. My uh, specific question is uh, more towards your experience in teaching students, because I believe when you have got uh, kind of experience, right, in, in uh, making and breaking projects in industry, you can understand the true value of SEMAT essence, right, uh, in an, in, to an extent. For uh, students who haven't really been exposed, right, to live projects, I can understand how they can uh, work with a specific practice, right? I mean, maybe understanding agile or, or waterfall, but getting exposed or understanding kind of the meta language of essence, right? Semat essence, semat. How do they grasp it? I, I, I wanted to understand that thing for me because I'm interested in that. I'm interested in collaborating with the Marcelo people like you and others, but that always seems to be because if I put myself in the shoes of them, I would have a very hard time grasping that. That's my uh, my own feeling. So if you could uh, share your experience this. Uh, this is a very complicated question because, uh, uh, you know, uh, Agile is essentially based on cooperation and uh, our general way of teaching is based on individualism, which is uh, uh, creates a, a, a really problematic uh, uh, ideas. So, for example, copying the, 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 the task from one student is bad because you cheated, but uh, in practice, if you make a, a project with, with uh, uh, four people and you don't cooperate, this is bad. So, it, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's easy for, for uh, both for us teacher and for the student to uh, understand uh, the, the difference uh, we we tend to uh, they probably uh, had uh, 13 years of school in which they had to be very individualistic and suddenly we asked them okay now you have to cooperate you have to learn this uh, uh, the assessment language that will help you communicate change talk uh, and, uh, and so on so yes it's difficult I think the the only uh, the only methodology, the only good idea is uh, doing a lot of uh, practical work uh, and uh, try with a small project, then a larger project, uh, so that they mm -hmm. grasp the idea and uh, compare the result among groups. The best groups are possibly not the best programmers, but probably are the best, uh, uh, had the best iteration, uh, interaction. This is what I think. I uh, hope I got you, uh, I, I answered the, the question because it was 
complicated. So uh, yes, yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. So no, no, that is... was useful, and 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 obviously it's uh, difficult. But thank you. I mean, that makes sense, especially the comparison point. So thanks. Thank you. Okay. If I could just say one thing, and that is, is that I've noticed a huge culture shift in education in Canada. I can't speak for the rest of the world. But when I, was a, when I was a student, individualism was the thing from all the way from kindergarten up to university. But that has completely changed. Group work is very dominant now, all the way through the education system. And, and at our university, you know, group work is the thing. In fact, we have to sometimes make sure that we do give them a chance to do some individual work so they build their skills at that kind of work. So mm -hmm. it may be a, a country-based, culture-based thing, but... Yes, I, I concur. Uh, even, uh, uh, for example, in, in our country, we are uh, education is very strongly state dominated, and the legislation uh, takes a lot of time to catch up with the real thing. So we are starting now uh, with some idea that cooperation is important, but uh, we, are, for example, we are probably. Uh, the day. What? Oh, yes. Uh, Something started. Yes, maybe you want to have the, the final comment. Uh, okay, so, sorry. It was something that started uh, behind in the. So um, uh, we probably are one of the countries with the uh, oldest uh, teaching uh, population, such as me. Uh, and uh, so change is not really, it does not come naturally. So it will take time. I concur that it is a worldwide shift and generational shift. Uh, and, and it takes time, both in, I think, in any subject, necessary computer science. Computer science should be easier in general than, say, philosophy. Yes, please, uh, Gerard. Yeah, so we can take yeah. this. Uh, I think that the shift is really necessary in education. So even if your countries probably don't are there yet, probably Munich is also not always there. We all have to make this change happen because otherwise the complex problems of the world are not solvable by individualism, but only by groups, by teams, um, often cross-functional. So we all have to learn that, especially our kids. Um, so I would urge you all, if not, if this is not the standard case in your education system, go out and change it at the school level and not at the university level. It's too late. So please, please spread the word and try to change the education systems in your countries. I'm trying I that do. in Munich. So <laughs> I, I try to do that, but of course, uh, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Whatever is possible. So in, in the United States, um, I can't speak for for any other place but uh, in, in the united states and particularly in new york there's currently an ongoing process in getting um the engineering programs um and specifically software engineering for better or worse accredited and there's one organization called abet which um does does the accredita accreditation um leads the accreditation effort in my opinion it's just a money-making scheme but you know but you know no one asks me so that's fine i guess but um the thing, the thing about ABED is that they're one of, one of their key, well, they have a bunch of learning outcomes, but it's quite apparent that uh, all the learning outcomes, they number them from A to K, or they're changing them from one through seven, I suppose, but it doesn't matter. What their learning outcomes is very centered around is teamwork and, and, and figuring things out together. And, and so it's, it's kind of echoing the sentiment that's been, dis we've been discussing here that, um, world moves away from frontal instruction and towards experience-based education in one way, shape, or form. Yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, for ones who are interested in the formal definition, so Joran's share in the chat spot here, so maybe you can read them uh, in a more detailed manner. Yeah, and maybe we, we let, let's uh, shift to, to Dennis. Yeah, yeah, so we are also very excited to, to hear from you, from your experience. And then uh, let's join again in the, the discussion after this. Okay, I hear me good? Yes. Okay. We're good from here. Um, 
So, uh, I am active uh, IT project manager and also PhD student at National Research Stone State University. And here it's our experience about what we do with course like software engineering and how we change it according to our introduction to essence and what changed according to this course. So, a uh, general description about this course for you to understand. Uh, first of all, this course is project-based, so it's active developing thing. You need to develop something. Students need to develop something. And also, they have a customer. Customer is not one of IT computer scientists, professors, or assistants. It's usually the person who not related to IT in any cases. In the last two years, it was persons from history department who just want several systems for them to work. So we try to emulate the real working with real customer who not an IT specialist. We split all our students in several teams, depends on how many of them, how many customers really want to be uh, with different amount of teams and something like this. It's uh, some kind of tricky questions, but it can be done. Uh, and all of them do the same project with the same customer, but they don't uh, com uh, compare to each other. They usually compare to themselves with uh, uh, logic of their project with your, with your customer desire about their specific projects. Uh, and what our as teachers goal in those cases, uh, we try to help teams understand what is development methods and how they need to combine different approaches, practices, what they can find, what they can read from different companies to work together and to make their progress. And then the subject is finished with that uh, cast, uh, our students' teams try to sell their products to customers who want them and also describe how they really develop what they develop. Describe the way of working. This course, it's one of the final year's courses, so all students know the most of basic tasks what he, they need to know. They know how to code, they need how to work database, they know how to make basic administration stuff, they know how to basic course with requirements, something like this. But it's the only one course where they need to work together and thinking about such things as project management software or ideas of managing something like this. Uh, so, uh, this is our last years of history of these projects and the some idea of what, what kind of these projects can be for you to understand the difficulty. And colors, it's about how we change those projects, how we change our idea of teaching this subject. Red is the when we use strictly unified process. Not rational case of unified process, but uh, easy case of unified process, but we strictly lead to them. So we... Uh, for the students uh, fulfill the unified process and go according to unified process in their projects. And 2017, we change our ideas. We keep unified process as the idea for describing the different software, software engineering issues, but we leave our students to the freedom in what they want to choose by using their own methods. And after it, we discover Essence, start to apply it and change our subjects to idea that we use Essence to describe in general issues about software engineering, students are free to choose what they want, but they need to create feedback about, okay, what they choose and how they can describe it using different, uh, different po points from essence to say, okay, we do something like this, we do something like this. Uh, QR code on the slide, if you want, is a link to the one of our, um, the most successful students work from, uh, last, from the last project. It's, uh, uh, plugin for Chrome for working with notebooks with many different references if you want to. So, uh, as I said before, before essence, most of what we use was unified process. Why we choose it? Because it's allowed to show many different points about working with your customers, with requirements, with uh, initial design, with not initial design of implementation, something like this. And as a plus, most of some of students, especially who work as the managers roles in the teams, start to understand why it's very difficult, why it's so important, and why you need to understand many different aspects of project management before you before before you can become project managers and also you can understand why project managers tell you to do something even if, if you don't understand why it should be done but the cons of using unified process that it's too excessive to few projects even the if you try to limit it by using the general ideas of what should be done it's still be too excessive different phases especially if you're talking about students projects don't have phase four at all 
uh, many different approaches and not for everyone's students they can get why you need why you need to be focused on use cases ideas of designing your projects even you don't use this cases at all and uh, the different cons that some students start thinking about the software engineering it's not about to help organize your work or do your project with, with limited risk it's about to writing the many different and useful documents artifacts something like this uh, and try to work with them with obligations, try to understand not why they need to do them, but just try to do them and then, okay, we are free to go and we want our marks. Leave us alone. Uh, but then we discovered Essence and uh, in this subject, we don't use Essence as the object of studying. We use Essence as the language of studying. We very short in just in one classes, present them idea what, less, what Essence is about, show, show them this is alpha, this is what work, this is practice, this is activity and what they need to be, what they mean to be together. And in the future, we use Essence as a language. If we have some issues, we try to express these issues using language and differ, uh, uses uh, different uh, elements from Essence language and show, okay, we're talking about that you have this situation, but according to what we see in your project, we have, you, have the, you have these situations. You see the difference? Yes, we see it. Uh, when, you, when we try to do the same ideas before using Essence, it was very hard to understand and mostly was main problems was using the different semantics of the same terms from different, uh, from different software development methods. Uh, so we changed it. We start to use Essence as the main language and it's allowed to for teachers to be not focused on the main idea of just one methods or show the and in the same time be, uh, show the different aspects of any software engineering issues and students still have the freedom to choose methods and practice as they want but they need to understand why they choose them and what they really choose Uh, to implement the idea according to tools, we use Redmine as, as project management system. It's free to download, you just need to host it. And we develop only one plugin for Redmine, uh, which allow us to work with alpha cards. So we in, develop our own plugin for working with Redmine for alpha poker. QR code is allow you to download it if you want, or you can just Google it. It's free, download it, use it if you want. So uh, in general, they use Redmine as project management system. So they appoint tasks themselves. They used Wiki in Redmine to show, okay, we have such kind of artifacts, what we want to do, what our next step. And also they, they measure their success by spending virtual money for this course. Uh, each team have their own budget for a project and they need to distribute between, between the team members. Uh, so in general, it doesn't require to be very big amount of work to establish this idea of, of, of of studying and uh, it's allowed to teachers to show the progress on different teams, to show the ideas, to show how they work and how they understand their progress themselves. Because for example, if teams say that oh, they already have established way of working, but they don't have any ideas about that, how they really need to work, because phrases are very simple enough to, to check them, uh, it's a, it allows to show them, okay, you, you make this checkbox, but this checkbox doesn't say anything because you don't have something to, to verify this checkbox in your project management system. Um, so what in general change? For the first class, students still have to work with customer, but in the same way, mostly on the practice, as the teachers will work with their establishing their way of working. So initial ideas to students, we just want to pick the methods which can be commonly known, accepted, or very famous. Usually they pick a different version of Agile and then, okay, they say, we all use Agile, or most of us use Agile. They come to the teachers, we say, okay, you use Agile, and what you do to use the Agile specifically, what your artifacts, what your ideas to work with, how you will be, how you will be, uh, fix, uh, how you will be fix your requirements, or how you will measure them, or how you will measure your progress or success according to the general deadline of the project. And then they face a problem that they have the right interesting words, about what Agile should be do, but they don't get the spirit of these words and what they really need to do to work in according to Agile, something like this. And after it, they come discuss it with, between themselves. They start to choose new ideas or new practices to do some ideas of how they need to work, return to us, and we do the same together. And the same way, they need to follow the establishing way of working in the same way as they're developing the project. 
because the journey of the line uh, last uh, last year was about just two months to develop the first initial version of the project. Um, and finally, the results of the subject depends on two parts. First of them is how customer satisfied with the project that he received. The second one, how the team understand they were working and the, how they're honest about it. Because if the team and the end of subject say that we all are project we do the okay scrum but we check the project management system they don't have anything related to any ideas of the scrum they just they just same okay you try to lie to us to cheat and you need to think better about how you really develop this project uh, here are the two slides about how what our plugin is allowed to do they allow to do create alpha poker state for each project individually and allow to change the columns for these cards so Initial you know, first column is about what you need to do before. This column is the middle what you're working right now. The right column is what you already finished. And also you can pop up the card, check the, all the checkboxes, and then move to cart to any place you want. So it's very basic idea what you need to do with just alpha poker. But this alpha poker allows the students to also have to-do list, even they don't have any experience about what you need, they need to do about the project management system at all. So if students doesn't visit the lectures, uh, some of them do, do this and don't have any ideas about what, man, what project manager should do, they always can look at the alpha cards and have at least some ideas about to-do list, what they need to do. They need to check the checkboxes because it's logical to do this. And for some projects, uh, things, it was very interesting case when they just see the ideas of uh, checkboxes and even try to follow the checkboxes as to do list for the projects, especially for the stakeholders up until the requirements part. So what are pros from using Essence to modify subject? Once again, we don't teach Essence as an object. We use it as a language for project management ideas. First and most important one, it's freedom for students to choose practices, but uh, this freedom still allows uh, teachers to check the, pro uh, check the progress of the, of the teams, which very important because when we have year with different methods, it was very hard to plan the lectures about, okay, right now most of your teams have the issue with uh, perilous analysis or something like this. Now we have such kind of idea of measuring the general project of the group, of the whole group of students because it's allowed to us to check and using at least alpha cards to, they, to, to them. Uh, and the same way, even the students choose very lightweight uh, practice, for example, agile or something like this, it's still allowed to teacher show that there are more issues in software engineering, it depends on the size of project you really want to. Uh, and also what's interesting case, it's about how student check their own progress by themselves. Uh, they can say, okay, we've done about 50% of, of, of our progress. So we halfway to the finish, but then we still, still look on the alpha cards and say, okay, you, you probably you have uh, halfway to finish your features, but it doesn't say about think, do you understand that your customer really want to, or what who will be, or who will be the real users of your, of your project, something like this. This allowed to show that developing, it's not just developing the software, it's about who will be using it and how you should implement it for them, for the future, for their business process, something like this. Uh, and also using Essence allowed to see the general problems, either design architecture, analysis parallels, or something like this, because you can see that some, some of your alphas go further and some of them not, not progress at all. So it's potentially that, you, that students team face the problems there. And also, as I said before, it's, it's uh, essence really allowed to show the difference between uh, letter of practice and spirit of practice. It's which very important for very famous and uh, not usually understandable practice, for example, taken from agile. So what cons? Uh, as I said before, the previous one, that most of famous practice doesn't really work with Endeavor on customer areas. If you're talking about alpha cards, al alpha cards alpha areas uh, and this caused two questions two problems two issues first of them you don't have any good examples of work products in those areas it's very hard to show the students what in general can be done or very good example how it can possibly be do in your cases especially if you don't use not very commonly accepted method or practice 
And the second one, it's related to the problem with um, two famous ideas of different practices and their problems with surviving paradox that uh, they don't focus on many areas of many issues, but too many successful stories about that companies who follow this process is, is uh, successful enough. And for some students, it's uh, really they follow in the success survivor paradox trap and think, okay, you cannot think about stakeholders using this agile will be successful enough. And we as a teacher need to show them that uh, even you see that company doesn't follow the ideas of working with stakeholders or something like this, it's not true because when they don't follow, it's impossible for them to be succeeded at all. And you need to make the difference about what you need to work in this. Uh, the second main problems and issues is that endeavor area of alphas in general is for measuring uh, progress of developers team, not for the project. Uh, if you're talking about students' team who just keep together and start to developing the new project themselves once first time in their life, it's quite the same. But if you're talking about, uh, as I said before, uh, when you, when you, when your student and finish your education come to the companies, you don't feel that you need to prepare your uh, way of working, practices, and methods from the from the initial step. You already have established one. And for students, it's not quite the same understandable idea why you, why they need to understand the establishing way of working progress and issues to themselves. When because when they come to just company to be just a regular developer, they already have they already will be having those problems solved for them. Uh, and it's quite a problem because in real cases, the same was uh, discussing the same problem with Paul that really in most companies where working will be established before your project will be started. And this alpha will be will be ahead pointed as a, as executive for many states before. Uh, but the second problem is way is recursive nature of way working. For those who know the essence, they need to know that alphas and progress of alpha states described by work products. In general, is true. Yep. Uh, but then I have questions. What is a good example of work product for way of working alpha? And me personally, I don't have question answer for this for this for this uh, question myself. For students, we design this way of work product. Say, okay, you need to put your team roles as a part of your describing in your wiki to your teachers to see how you're really working. But in most companies, it's no so it's no so true. So way of working is in the same way will be and alpha and the one to one work product who describing the way of working of the team. And it's some kind of looking as recursive way because to advise your way of working in your project or your team, you need to develop artifacts which can be called the team rules or way of working of your project or your team. It's not very easy to understand for students, and it's not very easy itself even for the uh, project managers with small experience. And last two issues, it's the same, that it's not so many different uh, good examples published of whole practices of methods. We just find only three of them on publishing practice library, but not all of them. And that there is no any, you can say, guides or ideas how you really need to combine, uh, uh, how you need to combine different practices in the one team methods. You can do it, but it's, you can, it's very hard to understand it's a good way to do it or not good way to do it. Especially we're talking with students when they just try to combine the methods uh, themselves by using different practices as they really want. Uh, and it's the last slide, it's the suggestions for discussions about what I, our ideas, what we, what we can do as part of community who try to make essence very popular, very famous and very commonly accepted in different areas and what we can do to progress the ideas. It's the last slide, so if you have questions, you can ask them. Yeah, uh, thank you a lot, uh, Dennis. Uh, also very interesting experience. Uh, um, uh, so we we run out of time here. Yeah, so let's. Uh, I suggest that we have uh, around twenty minutes uh, discussions uh, uh, before we closing these sessions. Then uh, we can have five to ten minutes break before we go to the second session of this workshop. 
Uh, please, uh, I already see uh, some comments and, and questions here. So just uh, speak out loud the comment from uh, Gerard. Uh, I think one of the biggest concern he points out is the requirements that are uh, normally not really a requirements. And uh, yeah, you end up there if you do a great uh, active uh, red AI or AI project, but it fails uh, business wise. Uh, yeah. One of my greatest agile projects was also my biggest fail in life. So <laughs> agile is not for itself something that is helpful. Um, it's not a mean to, so you have to have something that you should achieve with that. And therefore I think thinking in uh, other ways is sometimes better. So have a look at design thinking, lean startup and treat everything as hypothesis and you really have to prove that a requirement is a requirement because otherwise I don't accept requirements anymore. That's at least my experience. And uh, with that, you could immediately increase the likelihood that you create something of value. And uh, often I would say one third is at maximum the thing that you really should do. And you end up with much easier systems, much easier architecture if you don't accept every requirement as a requirement. And this is, as what I saw yet from, from, from Essence, this isn't even part of it, at least from I, what I could see uh, for today. I didn't know it before. Um, so um, this rigorous uh, requirements, elicitation, uh, not really seeing, believing what others say, but you really have to test yourself. Um, and that's a completely different mindset to what I got at software engineering at university. Um, if I may comment, uh, in our subject, we don't give the students a specific a strict list of requirements. We give them customer and give uh, and gives this and, and discuss with customer his potential wishes with what he wants to, to get from the students. But progress of uh, transferring the wishes of, sta of, stack, uh, of customer to requirements for the, pro for the, for the future system is one of the tasks of students. Yeah, but even so, what customers say, I don't believe them anymore. Yeah. Because uh, yep, I, I, <laughs> the only thing that counts is be, behavioral change of people or systems. Um, and that is not something that you can get out by asking nice questions. It's just not possible in my opinion or my experience. Right. Yes, um, I, yeah, I, I would, I would, I'm sorry to interrupt here uh, or, or to jump in there, but uh, I would very much agree with what you said. Uh, as a requirements engineer by training, I am a thousand percent with you. As a software engineering professor at a prim primarily undergraduate university with mainly technically oriented students, I'm going to tell you that they have to learn to crawl before they can walk, before they can run. And when I say crawl, I mean um, they need to even realize that there is a need to crawl. So I very much, I, I proverbially, okay. I don't actually do this, but I proverbially shake my students by the shoulders and say, you have to ask the stakeholder until they finally realize that they please, please do this. And I don't, I mean, okay. I actually shake my stomach, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will, I will, I'm yeah, driving the point home that they have to, everything is a requirement and it's only a requirement if it comes from the stakeholder or it's a constraint that comes from a legal document or whatever, but you know, that's, that's what we drive home. So, and, and, okay. but, I, but I'm, but I'm still, what I'm still kind of fuzzy about here is, is, um, is like a concrete example of what this would look like in the, in the, uh, Alicia, you, you reacted, you were going to say this. <laughs> I was, I'm looking for, can you perhaps give a concrete example of what it would look like to assess students? I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and add to your question because you're basically asking my question. Um, is not only to students, but also to industry folks. Like I'm looking at the cards and I'm seeing a card called team collaborating, work as, a, work as one unit, communicate, be honest. Like I'm just trying to understand a concrete example of where a software developer or a requirements engineer for that matter would actually use these cards in practice in a real project in industry. Like, is this you know, in, you know, to take Scrum as an example, like, is this something that you bring out during, um, uh, during our planning meetings or during the, the, the debrief? 
is this something that a developer will just like, you know, take a break and like look through the cards and see if they've met something? Like, I just, I don't understand how these are going to be used in industry. And if I don't understand that, then I can't apply it to teaching. Um, I think here, uh, I see Paul here. Uh, I don't know if he can speak about this because I, I, I think he know very well because he- Do you hear me? Yes, Paul, please. please you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you very well. All right, so, so I think this comes, this is a very good question. It goes back to a point I was trying to make in, in the short uh, keynote. Uh, I, I think you can go too far with it because if you looked at, if you took all the checklists and tried to lay them out and use them on a real project, it becomes overwhelming and it almost becomes like another method. And that's not what we're trying to do. I think it's more of something that you teach them the ideas and then you use it to help evolve your culture. You use it as I refer to in the back of your head. You use it as reminders of what's going on. Going back to those points about requirements, I completely agree with everything that was said. And when we were developing the, <clears throat> the checklists, we had these conversations. And so it, what we tried to do is capture into the states and, and what's not being talked about here, because that gets deeper, there are states within those requirements. And there was a lot of discussion about was, does a bounded state really exist? And for the same reasons that you're talking about, and does a coherent state exist? And what's the difference? And, and the issue that we know what we think are requirements are not really requirements, because when you, you get to a point where the customer's happy, and it's usually something less than was thought of as requirements, that thought process went into the development of the checklists that are in there. So you, I think you have to get to the, in the educational side, get to those discussions, have conversations with the students about why those checklists are there and what happens on a real project. Then to get to this question about how do you use it on a project, I personally think that the cards are good for training, but they'll get in the way of a real project. They're, they're, they, they, they're not something you pull out and use in the middle of the project. They just stimulate the conversation, just like a team that's, that's using Agile has retrospectives at the end of a sprint, and then they step back. That's a good time to start to bring the cards out to think about it, and then to stimulate that conversation as to what's really going on. So I don't know if I got to the question, but that's kind of what I, what I see. So, so the cards are not going to actually be used by real teams. They're used more specifically as a training activity. Um, yeah, gonna, my I'm thought gonna, was just the cards have a novelty effect. Like you're going right, to so use them the first this. couple of times and then just forget about them and leave them on your desk. Okay, so let, let me step back. You're going to get different opinions on this. Again, one of the things I said in the keynote, there are many ways to use Essence. There are people who want to use the cards and have tried to use the cards on a real project. You can pull the cards out and use them, for example, in a planning meeting. So when you're starting to address the project and decide what the scope is and where you're going, you could use the cards then, and you could use it actually in a retrospective. You could also, if you're a coach or a manager and you see something happening with the team, you could say, hey guys, let's talk about this and pull the cards out. So you could use them more explicitly that way. My exp I'm a consultant, I have, I have clients. I'm, I'm also from New York State in the United States. I have clients in the, in the United States defense industry. I use it with my clients in what I call stealth mode for exactly this reason. I think they, I don't, I don't wanna stop and teach them the cards. They, they, th th that just gets in their way and they have trouble with it. But if I understand it and then I can use it to stimulate the conversation, to get them to think about the issues that are going on because I have key checklists and I go, ah, this is what I think is happening here. We need to talk about this. Then it's, it's, it's a mechanism for, I think, particularly a coach or a consultant or a teacher to guide the team. And then other, other developers, as they learn it, they can become coaches to their teammates. So this gets to the teaming issue. So if this is, uh, and now I'm sharing how I use it. I'm not saying this is the only way to use it. There are many ways that it could be used. 
but that's been my experience. Okay, thank you. May I also say about how, how me personally using the alpha cars in my professional experience because I'm also IT project manager. Uh, I use them as a list of risks. If I have a feeling that my project has some issues and I don't understand why, what potentially can fail my project, I look at these cards and uh, just very very fast checking if I, it's potentially for me to check all the checkboxes where I'm supposed to be in. I don't follow the full alpha poker games for my project. I just, I just measuring the temperature. And when I find the statement, if I with, which I cannot check, check for my project right now, I potentially start to think if it's possible to fail my project in, uh, in this period of time or not. If it's not potentially the risk who will be fail my project, then I go to the next one. If I face the check box, which, which potentially can fail my project, I start to think, okay, what I can do to prevent failing or what I can, what I need to do to checking my list box in, in for, the, for this project, for this project specifically. And this is the way when I start to discussing this with students. If they want, they can also can work with this as to do list or risk list. What they need to be more important or make more attention when they start to develop the project themselves. Yeah, yeah. So then it's uh, just uh, also it looks fit for different ways of using uh, essence. Uh, here also in the comments, uh, Maslow share with some uh, problems in, in your uh, experience, uh, Dennis. So maybe uh, that can be bring further. Uh, Luis also have comments on Gerard. Uh, so mentioned about the goal uh, oriented requirements. Yeah. And also Timothy share about uh, also some concern about like how using a sense to, to, to address. Uh, maybe you can uh, uh, elaborate more on this. I don't specifically get the, I don't uh, get the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you look in the chat, I listed a bunch of things that, I, in my opinion, Essence doesn't address. It, it, it seems to have an ethos of waterfall, even though they say, oh yeah, it can be applied to anything. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and they listed a bunch of things. So uncertainty of requirements, constantly changing requirements, the need for small iterations that you get out early, um, user experience, automated testing, continuous, yeah, ah, okay. mm -hmm. and so on and so on. All of these things are, are central to modern software engineering that are really not there. The, the other things in, in essence dominate so much that they drown these things out, which are so essential. Um. Okay, I am agree with you because uh, the goal of essence not to be addressed for this uh, area of knowledge or this area of expertise. Each of them usually required additional special person in your team or special skills in your team to be handled with. Essence allow you to combine them together and see, okay, right now you don't work with requirements in a good way. Or right now you're messing with your continuous integration problems and your software doesn't, doesn't develop it as the one software for all of your project or something like this. But that's not what it says in the cards. In the cards, it says, checkbox, have you done this? Checkbox, have you yes, considered this? Yes, but... These things in this list are not in those checkboxes, and therefore, essence is a bad way to teach, I would assert. So, so let me jump in here. I, I actually kind of was pushing for us not to call them checklists for this very reason. And that's why I said, <laughs> not check the box checklists. That's not what we should be teaching people to do. They were worded and we went through thinking about how to word these things so that they wouldn't be used as check the box checklists, but rather would stimulate conversation. They're, for dis they're to get the team to have a discussion and to guide the team to think about the right things. So please don't use the checklists like checklists, I mean, it's a strange thing to say, <laughs> but, but they're, they're really a guide to think about essential things that make projects successful. Yes, uh, another comment at the, okay, so Tanya, um, 
yeah, there's an ongoing systematic review on the teaching methods. So I hope that uh, you will get uh, really inputs, a lot of inputs from the workshops, uh, your own here <laughs> about uh, engineering education. So yeah, and Chris also sharing information about uh, your game. So maybe you win have a presentation in the next session, maybe. Yeah, I see, yeah. So, so really also looking forward to that. Uh, okay, so maybe we have time for one or two more questions uh, or maybe one. And then uh, I suggest we have a, a wrap up and a yeah, short break before we get into the second uh, part of the workshop today. Um. I maybe have a question, a general yes, question I? for anyone who has used Essence uh, in education so far. Um, thank you for the presentation so far. So I would like to ask those people, uh, what tools have you used uh, to teach Essence or to facilitate its use among students? Because we have noticed that um, often uh, some kind of tools are used for, for either managing the cards or using the cards or teaching with the cards initially, or then uh, attract the alphas. For example, there's some tool for um, keeping track of the alphas. So what kind of tooling have you used and what kind of tooling do you think might be missing that uh, is not publicly available? I think it depends on the way how you teach essence uh, in your course and in what kind of course uh, the simple thing we are actually using is uh, physical cards i have them here on my desk we are we are re really using these cards physically in uh, in our project sessions so hand them out to the students and, and tell them okay use these cards in project status meetings or whatever and they just use them on the table and uh, to, to catch the status they actually take their smartphone, take a photo so, so they can record the actual state for the next meeting. So very, very low level, but uh, this is in, in courses where the actual idea of the course or the actual idea of the project is really a, a larger project, a larger idea, and we just sneak in essence that way. We just tell them, hey, this could be your tool to, to monitor your project. You may use it, and then they use it. Or they say, no, we just do something else. That's okay. Uh, but that's, that's the most easy thing to, to come in. And we have uh, created a digital version of uh, the very same thing. So having a, a website where you can do that electronically uh, if you don't want to play with this physical cards um, so that you can monitor your project there and, and uh, document a little more about your way of working by, by organizing the um Card. So we actually resemble on the idea of the, the wobble board, as uh, Ian Spence once called it. So just have a, a board where you have organized the alpha states into phases and uh, have, have a board where you can uh, watch the process state. So we don't use any more sophisticated things like practices or uh, teaching details on work products or so on. So, and then obviously you don't need the tool for that. Yeah. yeah so yeah. So here I can see we have both the digital and non-digital tools. Like because uh, uh, then they share uh, this link to to a plugin to read my project management tools. So maybe this is another experience. Yeah. Thank uh, you for the reply so far. Yeah. But, uh, okay. So yes. It's a tool that we already used. I talk about it in my presentation that we use yes. these tools. We also have second tool for in, right now in, in, co, in some state of course of developing. Uh, we create the tools once again for Redmine, which allow to import different practice, which can be described in practice workbench and modify Redmine projects according to rules of those practice. Uh, right now it's kind of prototype. It's not very good working, but in general, we try to develop, we, we try to develop this plugin too, which allowed to describe practice or method in essence using practice or bench, then import it and uh, re uh, redesign your projects and what should be done in your projects according to description of, the, of those practice. Yes. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so time is up. So I'd like to, to spend uh, the last minute to uh, say thanks again to Marcelo and Dennis for sharing your uh, very interesting experience uh, from different universities regarding to teaching uh, essence to students. And uh, yeah, um, uh, here in the in the calendar, uh, we schedule for the second sessions uh, the three fifteen. But uh, Jurgen, uh, we keep the schedule, or, or we want to have a bit longer break, maybe ten minutes break. Great. Uh, thanks, Anne. Um, I'm. Happy with with the with the discussion ongoing here. Uh, it brings something forward, I think. Um, to your questions, uh, should we keep uh, with a five minute break? Uh, I think we shouldn't uh, enlarge these sessions too much because we may have other interesting discussions too. Um, well, let's say to repeat at uh, to take the second session at fifteen twenty. So we've got almost 10 minutes to refresh uh, our body and mind. Thank you. Um, Bastian, this, this room will keep open, right? So we just uh, continue after a short break. So just no one click on end meeting for all and we're good. <laughs> Fantastic, yes, thank you. You got it. morning this is a test this is a test <laughs> it seems to be successful hi there one wonderful hello kendra we you can, can hear, hear you me? great good morning good morning good afternoon, <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> it's uh 6 15 over here bright and early Great, you managed to join us. Your mountain time? Pacific. Pacific, I get it. Well, it's uh, quarter past nine here at Eastern. Yeah, I had to get up at uh, uh, four to get in into the university. I couldn't possibly, <laughs> I couldn't possibly join the workshop th this morning from from the uh, from home because I would have woken everybody else in the house up. <laughs> Yeah, same. Thank, thankfully, I'm, my wife has that a very... Pacific time because that would have been one o'clock in the morning, you know? <laughs> uh, right yeah, if I'm pretty... Up. 
pretty early. Yeah. Is this uh, this is the probably the the most significant challenge that we experienced in putting this this conference together was to find time slots that would not be entirely insulting to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we knew we were going to insult some people or we're going to we're going to hurt some some people. But uh, so far, I must say, we, we ask those people that, you know, were, were hurt the most by having to do unreasonable times. And they seem to be OK, most of them that we ask, at least. And uh, everyone's being a good sport. So um, big, big kudos to everyone who's who's part of this conference. Uh, I've been teaching people in China and India and uh, Saudi Arabia and everywhere. So, I mean, the world is, <laughs> the time zones are falling apart throughout the world right now. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should just switch to star dates and, and you know, do away with <laughs> time zones. Um, Bastian, I've got a question um, regarding the organization. Bring I'm it. very glad with the discussion going on uh, live and mm -hmm. at Slack and at the chat here in Zoom. Mm -hmm. Will there be a way to transfer the things that went on in Zoom in the Zoom chat over to the Slack channel? Because I think it's more accessible afterwards, right? If we close uh, our workshop here with the Zoom room, uh, this will be gone. Well, right. we're, we're doing a recording of the Zoom, and that typically means that there's also the chat transcript will also be saved as a separate TXT file. Okay. Um, we hadn't really had a plan on doing that, um, but if you, well, we could upload it to the Slack channel because we hoped that we could maintain the Slack work workspace for forever or whatever forever means in Slack. Yeah. Maybe all questions get answered, but maybe there are keep some open so we can catch up afterwards. Okay. If needed. Uh, it was just an idea. Well, we're recording to the cloud. So, um, I, and I think uh, our friends from TNG are the ones who are, um, who are managing that for us. And I think uh, well, we will be able to retrieve access to the chat transcripts afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you can also probably configure that in your own um, Zoom settings that you want to have uh, these messages saved. 
I think it's configurable in, in the uh, Zoom settings. OK. I think actually the standard configuration is that it is saved. I have seen some some chat logs from other Zoom sessions on my uh, computer without having anything uh, changed in the settings. So I think the usual way is that it is saved and uh, will be found somewhere on your computer, wherever the default folder for saving the <laughs> chat sessions is. <laughs> OK, great. Okay, should we continue now? Kendra, are you ready? Sure. Great. Sure. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to session two. This is game based learning of essence. Uh, I am your chair for the session, Kendra Cooper. And we have one astonishingly good paper to discuss and present a board game to simulate the software development process based on the CMAT essence standard. Um, I am not going to butcher people's names here, I hope. Carlos, Grisa, and Jonathan uh, are the co-authors. And we are very fortunate to have uh, Grisa Maturana presenting for us today. Uh, she is a PhD student from the National University of Columbia, working as a requirements engineer and game designer. Her doctoral research focused on incorporating emotional transition pattern graphs in metaphor-based game design related to software engineering, using it as a tool for improving emotional design and game experience. So I will stop sharing my screen now and hand it over to our presenter. Hi everyone, how are you? Okay, I'm going to start to present. Okay, do you see my, my slides? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, we are from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. And um, our paper is a war game to simulate the software development process based on the CMAT essence standard. We are, uh, my professor, my advisor, my thesis advisor is the Carlos Mario Zapata Jaramillo. Uh, I am Grisa Benay Maturana Gonzalez, and my other partner is Jonathan Mauricio Calle Gallego. We, are, uh, we uh, are from the Linguistic Computational Group. Also, uh, we are going to talk about uh, the introduction, uh, the work uh, related, the CMAT essence game, the results, and the conclusions. Okay, uh, at this state of the art review related to the way the CMAP essence has been solved, reveals the development of some courses by using workshops and games of several types. These games could be card games, board games, um, trivia games, video games, and another. In that way, in the most of the cases in these games, uh, they include uh, specifications related to the alphas, the concert area, or the state of the, e e e of the CMAT essence kernel. But in a few cases, they include patterns, practices, or activities. In that way, uh, we have a lot of work, uh, work war games, uh, workshops, card games, and another. And the purpose of these activities is simulation or concept memorization. This is the case of a trivia game. You have to memorize some concepts. In that way, we create the CMAT Essence game. This is a game that is a simulation-oriented game, and it's based on the game life. I don't know if you are uh, close to this game. It's a part you have made so many parts and you have to choose things and something happens in your life. And that's the way. We, have, we use the same uh, metaphor and create, change the metaphor of this game and create a new game. Because when we are talking about uh, the development process, we have a part, we have uh, different uh, forms to do something, different ways. We, in our game, we simulate very a uh, lot of elements of essence, CMAT essence, like alphas, states, 
areas of concern, activities, work products, competencies, practices, and patterns. We include all these elements in our game. In that way, as you can see, we can have, you can find uh, the concert areas and each area is represented by a team. This team have to uh, reach different levels in these concert areas. Also, we use six, six alphas instead of the seven belonging to the standard. Because the way of working, uh, we suppose that the way of working is fixed along the game. Because if this game is for teams, maybe you have two persons, or maybe you can play with three students or, or with six. When you have the sixth version, uh, you have to collaborate with your partner, with the other player, to resolve the game. That's the idea. And in that way, we are applying the way of working. Also, we have a, ah, in that way, we create a hexagon as representing a practice. That is a normal symbol in, in the essence. Uh, also, uh, we have different paths. Each one of these is a level, is a path. And these paths have different spots. In this spot, you can find elements from the CMAT SS standard, like product works, activities, competencies, and some new elements that we call it a situation. The situation is for providing real links to our game because uh, we had different things that happen in, in the real world. And we want to include it in our game. Also, we have the representation of the state we conserve only five states because we realize that uh, some alphas have more states, but we only keep the first, the first five ones and represent this is the alpha and this is the state of the alpha. Okay. Also, we include in the pattern. The pattern, each team has a representation. As you can see, this is the concert area that you belong in. And uh, this is the representation of the roles. You are a player and you are a, a team working in the development process. And this is the, your representation as a player in the game. And we have the representation of the competencies. And the competencies uh, in the essence, in the CMAT essence standard are six. We have a stakeholder representation, analysis, development, testing, leadership, and management. For completing, we add in for the customer area, the competency, communication, and business mastering. And also in endeavor, we include project orientation. And we have three competencies for each co uh, concert area. Also, uh, we have activities card. Uh, we know, uh, we realize that we don't have a standard or defining uh, activity cards in the essence standard, in the CMAT essence standard, but we define it by using the project management and create uh, some examples of them. And this is one identify stakeholder is a common activity that we, that we realize when we have to develop a software. And that work product related to this activity, when you made an activity, uh, the result is a work product. And that work product, in this case, is the stakeholder list. And we have a card for representing that. All these elements, we can put it together in the practice. We have a good practice here. This practice is related to the alpha. And for accomplish the first step, as we can see of this alpha, we need to uh, uh, re reach these things. We need to um, we need to accomplish an activity. Also, you require some competencies for realize the activity, and the activities um, produce a, a, a work product. In this case, a stakeholder list. When you have all these three elements, you have a check. Uh, in this state of the alpha. In that way, we also have the situation. The situation is a random situation. 
And the random situation uh, is made with, uh, when you throw the dice, uh, you have one or two, you have a bad situation. Maybe you have problems in your team and the communication is bad and you need to improve it. In the way, you can lose your communication competency in the way. Other, in other occasions, nothing happened. You are doing a good job and it's normal. That is the case when you throw the dice and have uh, three or four. When you have five or six, you have a, something good, something happened. You are doing a very good job and you finish the activity to identify stakeholders, for instance, in this case. We test our game with 33 university students from four different universities. And they told us that this is an effective way to learn about the elements, symbols, and relationships related to the CIMAT essence. Also, they say that the CIMAT essence games may turn into a very competitive, but a still funny game. At the beginning, it's very hard to understand the game because we have a lot of elements. But after a while, you can uh, continue working in the game and it's very easy. As you can see, we have a lot of cards, we have the checkers, we have uh, our students have a really fun time with our game. Also, oh my God, what happened here? <laughs> Something bad. Okay, when we was testing um, our game, uh, we asked to our students what can improve in our games, and they told us maybe nothing in some cases. Uh, in other cases, uh, okay, I don't know what happened, <laughs> sorry for that. But maybe it's very complex to start up instructions because they have a lot of elements. In other cases, they say, okay, we need a visual representation of the advance of the game because it's very hard at the beginning. Um, at the conclusion, the CIMAT-SS game is a board game as a mechanism to simulate the main elements of the CIMAT-SS standard. Based on the state of the art review, we almost teach all the elements of the essence standard and it's something good. We create a new element called a situation for simulating and provide realism to the game. And the CIMAT game is a little complex, but it's funny and very close to reality. That was the observations. For the future work, we want to create new control mechanisms because that was one of the recommendations of our students. Also, we want to create a virtual sessions uh, with another people from other countries and have more information, collecting larger samples and more gameplays. And also we can compare traditional teaching experience with our experience by using the game. And uh, I have a simulation about this our games, if you let me a second, I'm going to show you. Okay, I'm going to share the other screen. And this is our simulation game. Okay. This game was developed, uh, uh, developing for students. Okay. Uh, we can have three or six players. Um, in this case, we are going to work only in two states. Maybe we have a uh, Carlos, uh, Grisa, and Jonathan. Uh, we are going to play. This is the turn of Carlos. Okay, I'm going to, yeah. And we have a practice. In the way, we are going to throw the die. We are going to advance in the game. And we acquire a competency, a competency, and we check it in our practice. As you can see, that is our competency now. This is the end of the turn. This is the next uh, player. We throw the dice. And also, we have an activity and we check it. We just only need the competency related and the work product. Uh, we are going to throw the dice. Um, okay, we have a work product and we check it. 
it's more funny when you have the students in a no digital version because they have to think in which one is the product work that they require it in each turn. And they have to uh, put attention in the competencies that they need for accomplish the state of the alpha. That is very nice. And um, that continue when we finish uh, this part. Okay, let's go to check out. Uh, okay, you have you already have this card, but in the real world, in the real game, uh, you in this case you can acquire the other competency. That is the reason that this is a maybe a good simulation of the game, but it's not the best in this moment. We are working on it. Okay, and that's all. Do you have questions? Do you want to know more about it? Okay, thank you very much. Is that tabletop simulator? Yeah, this is uh, the tabletop simulator. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to come back to the slides, if you want it. Okay. Uh, anyone have a question? They would like to have additional detail in a particular area? No, no, no. Really? I, I, just, I have a couple. Don't worry, I have a couple. <laughs> I, have, I, I have 10 if you, if you want. Uh, thank no, you. I'm kidding, okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you 10 questions. Um, I'm just, uh, oh, there is one here. Alicia is asking, is the game available for us to try? Again, is again game for what? Question from Alicia. Is mm -hmm. the game available for us to try? Uh, we have uh, the physical version. Um, <laughs> maybe you can print the game. That is something that we can share with you. You can print the game and have all the elements because we have all the cards, we have all uh, other things. That's the reason that we want to create a virtual uh, game because a good virtual um, game because we want to share with another people. If we have, uh, I don't know, if this conference is uh, a presidential conference, we have the opportunity to play sometimes because we always have our games with us. Uh, um, but yeah, we have all the games in the Jet Lysic form. Okay, Joran, would you like to uh, elaborate on your question? Yes, sure. Um, it seems you require quite a lot of your students um, that they know about Essence. How do you prepare them for your game? Are there any okay. lessons or lectures or other kind for of activities? Instance, we use this game for teach uh, CMAT because they don't have any idea about the CMAT, but after play our game, they recognize a lot of symbols, a lot of elements, they recognize practices, and we use this game for introducing uh, the CMAT essence to our students, students. Because after play our game, they say, oh my god, yeah, this is a competency. Oh yeah, this is an activity, and I ha I get a work product after that, and we use the game for that. So also, is it tied in with a specific course, or yeah. in, what's the setting for you to uh, to use the game? Uh, we use this game for uh, the requirements in generic course oh. in so many cases. And also, for we can change the method for this game. We can change the cards. Uh, you can apply another method for like a Scrum, Unified Process, Continuous Delivery, because you can change the activities. You can change uh, the work products because the structure of the of the board can apply for any type of cards. That's, that's something good of our game because you can teach uh, some activities you do have to realize for development process. Uh, independent, uh, I, we don't care about the, the domain. You can apply any domain. Okay. I have a question. Um, and maybe maybe some of the, of the colleagues from the previous session can join in too. The more I'm 
getting into this essence situation, um, the more I'm wondering what the goals are and the more I'm wondering what this provides that we weren't able to do before. And I suppose one key question, the one key way to answer this is assessment. Has anyone, you perhaps in, in your, with your game, assessed the learning outcomes of students before and after using the game, before and after using Essence? Yeah, for me, it's a very practical way to learn uh, best practices. I use a lot uh, the best practices uh, because a best practice is something that we can repeat and have adjective. If you can represent, uh, we have the representation of uh, Scrum, we have uh, the root process uh, by using CMOT. Um, in that way, we this game is just for recognize the elements of the CMAT essence standard. And after that, I can show to my students and other practices and other product works, and they recognize in that way and say, okay, this is something that we can use that uh, in the future is the representation of the knowledge. That's the idea. Paul, you had a question? Okay, that, that was an assessment. Um, my, my, oh. I'm, asking, I'm asking, how do we know that students learn something playing this? Okay, uh, we do uh, a pre-test and a post-test. In the pre-test, we show the symbols, the elements, and they say, okay, this is nothing for me. I don't have idea what is that. And if you ask to the students, what is an activity, a practice, they say, uh, I don't have idea. But in the post game, post test, we ask the same questions and they tell us, okay, this is a practice, this is the symbol, this is the competency symbol. And also we understand that our activities, the result of our activities are a work product and we need competencies for accomplish it. Okay, I understood. So, so you assessed the degree to which they were able to learn the essence game or essence, let's just say. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the aim, the goal for them was to learn Essence? The elements of the Essence standard, yeah. That's okay. the idea. I understand. Thank you. May, may I uh, come in, please? Oh, Paul. Oh, oh just, just please. one sec. Uh, Paul, Paul has yes. uh, been waiting patiently. <laughs> right. So, so, two things. One, I wanted to get a little bit at what Bastian was getting at with his question, but I can... I think partly answer that with the comment I wanted to make. Um, and I've had a lot of discussions on this with many people, including Carlos in, in South America. Uh, there's often confusion on the way of working and, and what it's adding uh, beyond what the other alphas are doing. And so they, they tend, people tend to put the way of working off to the side because they don't see added value. So let me give an example of why the way of worker is very distinct from the other alphas and it can get to the real value of what we're trying to do here. Um, let's take requirements. And this also gets back to the point about requirements. You can, what we're trying to do here is give you an objective way of measuring progress with respect to the goal, the real intent not with necessarily with respect to whether you're following a process. The real intent is to be successful, to make a product, to have happy customers. That's what we really want to get to. So these alphas are intended to help you measure how well you're doing towards achieving your goal. So let's take requirements. You might be have a requirements document. You might have something with lots of quote requirements in them. But the question is, are they any good? Are they really helping you towards the goal? Now, if you look at our checklists, they will lead you to have that discussion. Now, let's talk about how your team may be trying to get to the right requirements. You might be using use cases or you might be using user stories. Well, if you've got a team that's really good and they're experienced and they really are working well with the customer, to be honest, what we see in industry 
is teams that are really good and work with the customer, they figure out the requirements. They don't need a method. They don't need, they don't even think about whether it's user stories or use cases. They just know how to do it and they know how to get agreement. If that's happening and you look at the states of, of requirements alpha, you will be progressing it. It will be healthy. That's another word we use for the pro it's progress and health. Is it healthy or are you in trouble? So you could be moving requirements along, but guess what? If you go to your way of working, you might not be following it. Way of working may be in trouble because you said our way of working is using use cases and nobody's doing use cases, but, but they're getting to the requirements. Why? Because they have experience, they're competent, they're working with their customer. So here's an example where you're progressing requirements, but your way of working may not be healthy, all right? Maybe it's not a problem, by the way, too. Maybe you decide, we, even though we said we were going to do use cases or user stories and we're not doing them, it might not be a problem because we're getting where we want to go. But what, what I'm explaining here partly, I think, is getting at Bastion's question, what are we really trying to do with Essence? Well, what we're trying to do is get to the essence of success on projects. But what you get is insight by using all of the alphas. You, the team learns why they're successful. And they're successful because maybe they have competent people. That may mean they have risks because if those people go away and they're not following the process, how are they going to bring new people in? Another discussion that can be going on. So, so my, my point was actually not right. I, I, I'm beginning to step behind of that and I'm still not quite sure what's new about this that we didn't already know before, at least those of us who who have been, let's say, you know, somewhat decently successful in, in teaching this or have been somewhat decently successful in working with us in the industry. And you just said, you know, competent people don't need this. And I'm, all right, fine. But, but here's the thing. What I just meant was, all right, so we use Essence as a tool to teach software engineering theory to, 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 soon, to, to students. Then wouldn't we need to assess the learning outcomes? Wouldn't we need to assess to use what I believe to be the correct language here, wouldn't we need to assess how much they're able to, what competency they gained in their alphas? Yeah, I think that's I think that's missing here, and I think there's a gaping hole here, and I haven't seen anything about you know whether or not this works for yeah, students. I'm with you, and and the, the two point two points to make to that, one with regard to what's new here, one of the things we used to say. And, and some people said, maybe that's not, it's not a good thing to say, is there's nothing new here. The intent was not to create anything new, but to extract from the knowledge we already have the essential pieces that are always there on successful projects, regardless of what method you're using. So when somebody looks at it, you're Care, not careful because suddenly we are in comparison mode to the SWEBOC, right? The software engineering body of knowledge. And a lot of that discussion. has been... Yeah. around for years and that's right. been very successful so and and the diff the difference is Swebach is common practices essence has no practices we are intentionally staying away from you won't find any practice user stories use cases in essence what you'll find are the underpinnings that are common to them all that's the fundamental distinction so and we've had discussions with the Swebach people uh, as to how we relate to what they're doing. We don't think it's it's in, in conflict and it's not redoing what they're doing. Because again, we don't have any practices. But you're, to your point about assessment, I agree with you. There, in fact, when we started this whole thing 10 years ago, there was an assessment track. In fact, I was leading it with Watts Humphrey. And uh, the whole idea was to eventually have an assess a way to use this in, a, in an assessment capacity. I don't think that's gotten the attention that it, that it, it, it's an area that probably should be looked at more now for just your point. How do we assess whether this is working, whether it's actually helping people? It, 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 that is a good issue to bring up. If I could say something, you said that it doesn't, it doesn't include practices, but as I read the wording, there are practices that are inherently visible in the wording of all of these items in these in these cards. I mean, system fully documented. It implies the practice of fully documenting. And it, Agile it, says don't fully document. It says 
you know, working code over documentation. So, you know. So here's the interpretation, and this is where you really have to get in. We, you, you can pick at the words, and we may have been able to use better words, but the, the way we interpret that is within the context of your project. In other words, what is fully documented to me? It could be very lightweight. It's what, what, is, what is according to the way we have agreed to, to operate. So fully documented doesn't mean heavyweight. It doesn't mean anything about how it's documented. It doesn't mean it's in a Word document. It's fully documented with respect to your context. And it might be very lightweight because that's all you need. So that's the interpretation. That's why these are intended to be, you always have to use them within the context of your program to make an interpretation. And we expect people using them to make that interpretation. We were not intending to tell you how to document there, but we're telling you, yeah, you need some documentation, but you decide how much that is. That's what the fully means, fully within your- uh, So incredibly important. People pick on a word like fully, and they run with it and they will use it as evidence and they will say, you're not doing the job. That word fully is, is so leading that if you, you, know, you, you can argue if you against it. If you had been one of the volunteers when we put these checklists together, we probably would have listened to you in hindsight, that's probably, and by the way, there are updates to the OMG standard. We've we've submitted them. We've had revisions, and that's an and we've fixed wording like that in the checklist. And if that's a problem, and I think I think that is a good point you're bringing out. That foot word fully needs to maybe we need a different word there, and we should fix that. And there are other cases like this. There's like I said, we had lots of discussion about the the state bounded. It, it, that people kept saying. With a state bounded, you're making this waterfall. And we're going, no. What bounded means for us, what we were thinking, is you have to get to a point where you have some level. of it's uh, The example I like to use is Alistair Coburn, even with agile approaches, talks about coarse grain and fine grain requirements. You have to get to some point where you've scoped this thing. That's another word we were thinking of with bounded. You've got, and so, so, yeah, there, there's a lot of words you can pick on, but wording is a big part of this and communication of what those words mean is a, is a, I think this is a big thing that should be in education, teaching people how to interpret these words and coming up with maybe where they're weak, maybe where they should be improved going forward. But even when you say scope, well, you know what? It's recognized in many software systems we don't want scope creep, but we want flexibility of scope. We want to be able to take move in new directions as the market changes, as many things change. And so the scope should be dynamic. It shouldn't be. We, we, you know, no, very good. Now let me, let me run with that. Very good. Again, here's the example. It, and, and if, and when you go to the work alpha and you, it, and by the way, work, is really the management alpha. A lot of people, aren't, we used the word work. Originally, the word was project. And then people said, well, we all software development doesn't happen in the context of a project. Sometimes you just have this maintenance that's going on. So we, we changed the word that alpha to work. But work is really about the, the, the whole management piece. Now, to, get, to getting to your point, what it, 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 on some projects you may want the scope to just keep going, but there's other projects where you have fixed scope, you have fixed cost, you have you have a fixed schedule. In, if that's the case, you can't just let the scope run, or you're going to fail. So this is teaching people to think about the context of their program. If they if they can allow the scope to go, and the customer is happy with that. You're right on. That's what you do. You make that interpretation. If you've got a fixed schedule and a fixed cost, you're in a different ball game, and you have to interpret that differently. I could probably go on with a hundred criticisms I have of this. I will stop. <laughs> Let other people go. Okay. Uh, you're in. Uh, you're next. Do, do you uh, have something to uh, to add here, uh, particularly um, on the paper, the the game? Yeah, about the game. Um, yeah. How did you balance competition uh, versus uh, collaboration? Why did you 
choose a competitive approach? Okay, uh, in this part, um, okay, I'm going to show you. Um, we have uh, these checks, and in that way, I, I can respond to the, the question of Alice. This one. We have checks. If you have uh, most of uh, the winner is uh, the team that have more uh, state of the alphas checked. In that way, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six for the endeavor team. In that way, this is a winner of the game. And we can check because they have uh, more advances in the, in, the, in the development process. That's the idea. They already have more activities. They have more work products. They already have uh, reached the, the states of the alphas. OK, thank you. And uh, I'd like to come back to Bastian's question uh, before. Um, I agree that there is not that much assessment yet. Um, we've got some uh, qualitative studies um, with a smaller audience. Um, one was, was done by, by me. And what I observed with, with the students, I renewed a course uh, where we were using a heavily customized uh, open unified process to guide them to so learning requirements, implementing, and so on. And the difficulty I, I faced always was uh, before uh, that students had difficulties to orientate in, inside the process. Where are we right now? Why are we producing such work products uh, like a requirements document, use cases, and so on? Uh, all they did was looking at the timetable, which uh, work product do we have to deliver to determine where are we in the process? and what I observed with uh, using the assets kernel was uh, it was much easier for them to see uh, where, are we, where are we coming from, where are we right now, and where are we heading to, and why do we do this? Um, we didn't use every single point at the checklists, which are not just to check, you know, um, but they had uh, the holistic approach. They, they saw software development projects are not just uh, programming and implementing and creating, but you have to see other aspects too. And uh, this was very helpful in my experience. Um, it's documented and uh, I can send you a link. The workshop was, was made for igniting such discussion. Uh, so maybe we get some of those studies who can compare the one way and the other one. So I think this is very helpful, such discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, do have a pending question from Alicia uh, on the alpha measures. Uh, yeah, it's in the way oh, we the chat. Yeah. And another question. Oh. Yeah, I guess we can, well, so, it, this is all part of the, the larger conversation around uh, assessment of the methodology for the purposes of education. Um, so this was in response to Paul, but I don't know if he's still on. I thought he stepped away. Um, but I'm back. If, if the checklists are not checklists, that means they're not techniques for measurement. And so I'm I, I'm trying to understand both how within a project, like my students would understand whether they're um getting better as software developers and so i guess in hearing the the response to the previous question um from uh Joran, the the question that i now have is is i feel like essence as an education technique needs validation studies to show that it improves students ability to do software engineering activities rather than just learn the essence process itself. So can we demonstrate that learning software engineering with essence is superior to learning software engineering without essence? That's my, my question. And has any study been done like that? If not, this is where I think this community needs to go. Uh, I, I have a little uh, answer for that. For me, I am a visual person really. I just need to see all the process. And for me, uh, something good for the CMAT essence standard is that you have a visual representation of the activities uh, that you have to realize and the works that you have in, all, in any process, really. 
because you can apply the CIMAT essence uh, standard in any field. In this moment, uh, for instance, for me, um, we have a, a, a audio tip to, we want to describe the practices for uh, designing games because when you want to design a game, a lot of people say you have to do this, this, this. I mean, it's an a implicit way, but you don't see the explicit way. And for me, it's very nice when you have the CMAT representation because you have an explicit way to do something and you can uh, uh, adapt uh, for your process uh, the elements of the CMAT essence standard. Okay, Paul. Um, so Paul, Paul, you have something to say? Add in? Yeah, I wanted to just say that I wasn't sure who was phrasing that question about assessment, uh, but to say that where we should go, the education community, to show that 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 we're training people uh, in what we really want to train them in. We do it better with essence than without. I am completely in agreement that that's the assessment that should take place because that's what's missing on why industry looks at it and go, well, why should I care about this? What's it gonna do for me? If they knew, if we could take evidence to, to if I could take evidence to some of my clients and say, look what we've shown. If you're gonna hire people out of the universities. You hire people that have learned essence Look what's happening when they go into industry. They become better at what you want them to do. Wow. Do you have evidence for that? We you have. Need okay. Can I advertise my paper a bit? Sorry again, but we actually did something along those lines with the project based course. I'm just going to link it. It's an archive, so you can just, if you want to look at it, it's, it's just preliminary work. We don't like conclusively say that, okay, Essence does this so much better, but. Uh, at the very end of the paper, there's the four bullet points where we we, we thought based on the data that uh, the students seem to better grasp the idea that uh, you should be open to the idea of using different methods for different situations and that uh, you should uh, tailor the methods to better suit the situation at hand, which is uh, what organizations um, to some extent are doing. They use in-house methods, but they should be perhaps more open to the idea. So. We felt that in education, the essence is useful because then you don't have to necessarily teach students like, okay, this is Scrum, this is how you do things. Uh, well, we did that, but then we kind of taught them how to use Scrum bot instead. So they took Scrum and uh, using essence, they tailored, uh, most of them use Scrum and then the, they tailored some version of Scrum bot on it. But the idea was there that the essence encouraged them to tailor methods so to critically evaluate how they work. Right, but I could make the same argument about my students. I haven't done the study yet. Um, given that I teach them methods, they try them out and we customize them and they learn that customization without essence. So yeah. I guess I, I really think that there needs to be a focused effort on like properly done uh, pedagogical studies of the teaching of essence. So I, I strongly you. urge the community, and and I'm and I agree with pretty much everything that Tim has or Timothy has said uh, this morning. Um, so I strongly encourage the community to go in that direction. Right. Yeah, I agree that it's not uh, definitely you can learn how to customize methods without essence. That is for sure. It's not uh, something unique to essence, but it does drive the point across for what it's worth. I think we need evidence. I mean, Alicia is 100% correct. And, and we need evidence that this works. Um, I'm, could work, not sure. I'm in agreement. I'm certainly in agreement with the games approach to teaching software engineering. And the board, the, the notion of the board game itself is quite, exciting and it, if there was evidence that essence was good and or and or we could improve essence to actually cover the spectrum that i think it should then the game is i think is looks fantastic thank you so much i think the game if if essence here's the thing if essence is successful 
let's just assume it is. And, you know, I and mean, Paul says it is, but we are lacking evidence, right? So um, if, they, if we have evidence that it's successful, there's a, there's a, there's a case that could, be, that could be made to not only instruct people to be successful and efficient software engineers, we can also instruct people to become effective software engineering educators. It's getting a little meta here. But this is this is where I see um, the um, this is where I see the game like uh, Grissa has presented here, where I see this particularly helpful. You're teaching people the the essence method, such that they can go out and teach other people how to how to how to be effective software engineers. So. Um, if it's if the base method is is. If the is base right. method is sound, yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, so could could you uh, possibly elaborate on your methodology a, a little bit in terms of uh, uh, you know the universities you involved uh, the kinds of courses uh, that were related to the study you did um, and how you acquired the feedback uh, did you just uh, was it like informal ad hoc interviews or a questionnaire uh, how was that uh, how were these results uh, uh, acquired. Uh, we made a, a survey uh, with uh, related to the game to our students. Uh, in this is like uh, old game models. We now have better funds to acquire the information. But in this game, when we did this study, we use a survey after uh, this game. And uh, when I was teaching uh, a little bit about the CMAT essence standard, uh, I just start with this game. And um, after I was uh, showing different methods by using the, the CMOT uh, representation, they understand all. I don't have to teach, uh, okay, this is the symbol of competency or this is the activity because they already have all the knowledge after playing my game. I just reduce uh, a, a big boring class related to the symbols or the uh, elements of the CMAT standard by using this game. Because I just uh, show the game, they play the game, and after that we can talk and we can work with the elements of the CMAT essence standard. That is something very nice. Uh, and I just introduced um, this uh, standard by using this game and it's very helpful in the classes. And they are have a, a very funny time. They enjoy really enjoy the games uh, at the classes because it's changed their way to teaching. So it sounds like a great uh, complementary approach. Uh, integrate it with some lectures. Uh, offload the uh, more mundane, uh, fundamental definition type things to a game. That sounds great and. Um, you, you did identify a, a concern with the uh, uh, with the onboarding. Um, have you thought about uh, how you might address that in uh, another version of the board game, or moving it when you move it to a virtual game? How you might address that with levels or another mechanism? Uh, for this game, we only have these levels mechanisms and use uh, these elements. We also create another games. I have. Here are another game. Uh, uh, you can see it. <laughs> okay, but this is another game. Uh, this is for teaching metrics, and we use the CMAT representation, the CMAT standard representation. Also, we have another game for teach uh, uh, building process, and we create a lot of games that use the elements of the CMAT standard because uh, they identify that this is uh, a pattern, this is a competency, this is an activity. Um, we create a lot of games uh, by using the CIMAT representation, and also we can teach any field by using the CIMAT essence standard. Um, for this game, we don't have a, another version. We can improve it, but in this moment, we are not working in that. We are creating new games uh, for teaching something and other topics uh, by use, but our games uh, are usually include uh, the elements of the essence, the CMAT essence standard. Okay. Sounds terrific. 
yeah, uh-huh. that's my work. <laughs> that's your work. Yeah, I like to teach uh, with, with games. It's, it's a, a very funny way to teach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any other comments or feedback, uh, suggestions? Uh, um, when I working in my courses, we um, in the research group, we want, we really enjoy to put to the students to create their own games. Don't feel afraid to do that because uh, maybe they can use, they can learn to use the SMA essence standard applying in a, designing their own games. That is something very nice. Even if you don't use the the, the SMA essence standard, uh, for me, uh, it's very important to put the students uh, create their own games for learning something new and share these games with the other students because they really have a beautiful minds and when they apply that knowledge in a game they are practicing uh, more and more and learn very uh, learn so many things when they are designing a, a new game and they have all the abilities because they are uh, a new community we don't grow up with games but they really uh, grow up using games in all the aspects and um, that is something new uh, good that we can use in the classroom yes the students love the games they love to develop them they love to play them they love to uh, talk about them with their friends uh, they're yeah. just uh, just uh, immersed in them 24 7. Yeah, it's a very best, uh, good practice in the classroom, and I have very good results. Uh, I have students that say, I don't like to play, but after play our games, say, oh my God, this is amazing. And they develop their own games and are amazing, and, and I am a fan of the games uh, for teaching. If I can, <laughs> I want to, to, to have all a, cor- all a complete course by using games. <laughs> That's my dream <laughs> someday. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. I think uh, perhaps if other people in the community here and participating today uh, will probably want to get in contact with you to discuss some things. Um, we'll, uh, I'm sure the uh, email and all the contact information is available. So uh, I think this would be a great place to uh, pick that discussion up. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's my thesis. I am developing a method for anyone to create any game changing the method for the original game. And that's the idea that anyone can create any game for teaching. So we're engineering in this case. Uh, um, the Slack workspace will stay available for whatever forever means um, in the context of Slack workspaces. So um, if you, after the conference, would like to return here and keep discussing, then feel free. It's going to be there. OK, thank you. It's awesome. <laughs> Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, I think uh, perhaps we could wrap up this session, session two. Uh, going, going. Okay, go on. Uh, we'll conclude session two of the workshop. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kenneth. Thank, Thank you, you. Susa. Thank um, you. I think we will make a short break now. Um, it's already quarter past four, so we wanted to start here, but I think there is some buffer left. So should be uh, should five minutes be sufficient or should we make a longer break? Michael, what do you think? You are the chair of this third session. I think we should, yeah, five, five minutes, 16, 20, I think is good. Okay, thank you. Uh, one recommendation is to read the, the questions in the chat of you too. I don't know if we are reading the questions.
Yeah, um, there's been a, a, a number of uh, comments. I've tried to catch everybody who's typed in a question on the chat. And there's some additional information people have provided, some, some nice links and things for further information. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to check. <laughs> We, uh, can we grab the uh, chat? What? No. No, I, Actually, I yeah, if, it seems like uh, if you highlight the everything in the chat session and just mouse over and highlight everything, it lets you write mouse and copy. So you could possibly just grab a, a copy of, of the session uh, just for your reference later. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, Joran. My microphone was muted. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, How are no you? Problem. I'm good. How are you? Great. It's, it's been a great session. Uh, very enjoyable. Yeah, so it was lovely, right? Uh, this is what we hope for, uh, some kind of real discussion. Yeah. Maybe sometimes uh, controversial, but that is uh, what yeah. such a workshop is for, right? No, that's good. I think Bastian was keeping us honest, right? Uh, yeah. Somebody, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and we really appreciate <laughs> this. I think, I think, yeah. Well, if you if if you knew where I came from, then um, then you will know that polarization is uh, is in my second nature. <laughs> um, well, the the thing the thing is this, right? We need we need evidence for any for all claims we do, right? We are, I mean, we are um, we're we're scientists after all, right? So um, I think I think um, that's 
it's what especially nowadays when you know you can st make some random claims for example oh these ballots shouldn't be counted for because they are fraudulent for some reason you know i think it's important we have evidence and i think i, I i'm always some my my perspective when i teach software engineering is always that you know easier is better um you know, and easier is like vastly, but we don't need another method to teach how how to exactly make an UML class diagrams. Like no one gives a hoot. What's e what, what we need is, you know, we need easy industry applicable things that, we, that, that solve real problems, right? And more importantly, um, we also need evidence that these things work. And um, so I think Essence has a, has a really, has, has a really potential here. Um, we need some assessment here first, right? We need we need proof that it works because right now I'm like, all right, I'm my method is working pretty well too, and you know, I don't need alphas. And for the love of Pete, can we call it something else than an alpha? Think of alpha male, and that makes me throw up in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> I can see Paul uh, peering intently, so I don't know if he's about to say something right now. Uh, Michael, I think we could uh, start if you would like. Yes, I think so. We should start. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to start our third session today here in our workshop. And uh, my name is Michael Strieber. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your session chair for the next 60 minutes. And uh, I'm located in Germany at the University of Duisburg-Essen, where I work as a, a postdoctoral researcher. And I've been involved in the CMOD and Essence uh, activities since, uh, yes, 10 years, about 10 years now. And I was active during the standardization activities in the language track. And yes, we have the third session here, which I have the honor to chair. And the title of our session is uh, Essentialization of E Practices and Methods. So if we have a little shift from uh, learning to using, so it's less about how to teach Essence or what we can learn with Essence, but it's more about how we can use Essence for defining some practices or methods. And uh, that will surely bring us some more good discussions as we just had in the previous sessions. And we will have, once again, one presentation. Um, the paper has the title, Extending the CMAT Kernel for the Practice of Designing and Implementing Microservice-Based Applications Using doma Domain-Driven Design. And is written by Patra Zarati Ray and Pinak Panipal. And our presenter will be Pata. Thank you that you are here with us. Pata received a Bachelor of Engineering in Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering from Yadavpur University in Calcutta and a postgraduate diploma in management with specialization in system and finance from the Indian Institute of Management also in Calcutta. And he has significant experience in IT and management consulting and program and project management as part of the leadership teams at PricewaterhouseCooper and um, IBM specializing in delivery of compact, complex IT transformation solutions to global clients. So a lot of industry experience gained, but he's currently working on his PhD in computer science from the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta and intends to leverage his large IT experience in the field of software engineering. And I'm very happy that he's now available for to speak to us here. Partha, the screen is yours. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, great to be here. Uh, and and uh, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. uh, is, this, is this visible? Uh, am I, is my screen visible to all of you? Not yet. Let me know. We still don't see your screen. That doesn't look good.
Is this better? Is that looks yeah. better? Okay. okay. Uh, is the screen completely visible now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's it sounds sounds a pretty fancy title, uh, extending the SEMAT kernel for the practice of designing and implementing microservice-based applications using domain-driven design. This paper has been written by myself and Pinak Panipal. Uh, so, so just a quick forward uh, before we get started. So, so, so why, why, why this particular practice? Uh, so, we are, we are, so essentially we are talking about all this digital transformation, right? All this stuff around us and uh, and, and, and microservice architecture is something which is spoken about almost at every turn, right, of the road. And we have success stories too, right? Netflix, the Amazons, the Ebays, all those. So there, there are so many success stories which abound uh, everywhere, but also there are lots of challenges uh, since when we are talking about digital transformation and uh, we are talking about uh, taking a look at the application landscape, reimagine them and do all this stuff and use microservice architecture. Uh, it is essentially about splitting the business domain into a distributed software architecture, which obviously comes with its own challenges. Now, and this is where uh, the software engineering process comes in because uh, the, we can apply the proven practices here to help us with in this regard. And, of course, this is where SEMAT can play a role because, uh, again, it is, it is those uh, meta language facilities, right? We can, in a way, kind of pick and choose the, the best examples or the best uh, practices, right, to, to help us here. And which is what we wanted to do, uh, which, and uh, we spoke about microservice architecture, but at the same point of time, we are using domain-driven design at the, uh, centrally there. And this is, this is a significant exercise again. <clears throat> so we have started off here by trying to identify the alphas which would be relevant to this practice, right? And this is where extending the SEMAT kernel to do so. And uh, this uh, work would be ongoing. Uh, we intend to cover the work products, right? And the activities associated with that to create the interlinkages. But this is in this particular paper, we are talking about the alphas, how we have defined them and to explain uh, about them uh, a bit more. How does it uh, relate to the education? Uh, so two things, uh, we, are, we are thinking about that this can provide them with kind of a gentle introduction from the method or architecture perspective to an extent. Uh, however, especially more so if uh, SEMAT essence is involved as some of our uh, illustrious uh, people who did so earlier spoke about, because these is talking about a practice which is being used industrially and how we are extending the uh, SEMAT essence kernel to kind of uh, make it uh, come through in real life. So with, with that con context, uh, let's quickly move on. Uh, so, so microservice architecture, I think some of this is pretty well known, but we'll uh, quickly go around that. So this particular architecture is predicated on developing an application as a collection of services. Uh, it has to demonstrate certain specific behaviors, uh, cohesiveness, uh, loose coupling, independent deployability. All of these are in uh, direct contrast, right, with the traditional monolithic architecture, which we spoke about. And, and each of these uh, services would ideally be in charge of its own individual data set logic and behaviors. So, so uh, we would talk about the term uh, bounded context. Let me preempt it here. Uh, what it does, it tries to combine the related business functionalities into a single business capability. And in the ideal world, each microservice would implement one such capability. Uh, 
what advantages uh, does this architecture provide us? I mean, I mean clearly, I mean, it, it, it provides us addressability with the requirements and the system structure. Again, that's that's kind of a, kind of a given, right? With many architectures, but there is a there is a very concrete proof point here in the sense that uh, in the spirit of the CI/CD and all those stuff, uh, we can we have that luxury of changing only one microservice and redeploy only that in order to achieve uh, the updation of a specific feature. So that is that is uh, kind of you know. Uh, that specific uh, traceability for you. Talking about domain-driven design, we are uh, using the acronym DDD throughout. Uh, so uh, this is where we talk about Evans who pioneered the context, uh, the, the concept, and who identified the essential principles, activities, and patterns when uh, DDD is being adopted. So. Uh, we had a lot of discussion regarding the requirements, right? And, and again, in my own experience whatsoever it is i mean i think that is that is primarily one area which kind of makes it right? and however so many um, uh, so many treaties are written about that etc doing that in real life in practical scenario it is, it is a real it's a real art right that is that is where i think some of the fundamental challenges lie so ddd what we are talking about here essentially it helps to facilitate uh, depicting the real world uh, in the architecture itself. So again, we spoke about uh, bounded context. Here, the bounded context can imply the organizational units uh, of the, when we are talking about the proposed system architecture. It also focuses on the core domain. Thus, altogether, it, they help us to improve the software architecture quality. So DDD, uh, it uh, maps the business domain concepts into the software uh, and at the heart of it is a domain model and its usage can provide significant benefits in uh, building microservice architecture. So uh, there are certain considerations uh, which we want to talk about before we uh, talk about the alphas uh, and this stuff. Uh, so couple of factors which would be very key uh, would be the functional decomposition of an application and uh, the decentralized governance. Now, a uh, 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 pretty fundamental design challenge would be identifying what would be the right kind of partition right, of the system into microservices. Because essentially the, the system uh, behavior is demonstrated to the behavior of this microservices and that architecture would have a major impact on the system performance because too many chatter right amongst the microservices can be a killer so essentially that autonomy of this individual microservices is a very cherished attribute in that in that vein uh, again ideally each service should cater to only a very few specific responsibilities and even better, one single responsibility. And this would have a bearing on the application's quality of service. Uh, when we are talking about uh, DDD, uh, so, so very fundamental to it is to continually keep on questioning and adapt the domain understanding. So it lends itself very well to the agile software development process. Okay, and, and as, as we said, uh, quickly going back to the bounded context. So uh, what will also happen uh, that this, the system would be divided into subsystems, aka the bounded context. And we will see later that one, again, uh, intent would be to have each individual team being in charge of one individual bounded context. And as we have told before, the each bounded context should be implemented as a microservice. So now we uh, go into the proposed alphas. We have identified, or we, we have three alphas here. Uh, one, one alpha is regarding the requirements. Uh, they would extend the requirements, uh, uh, kernel alpha. Uh, the other two would be on software system. So right now we are talking about features we had and, and they are addressing the user or system requirements. 
clearly they would impact the usability and the value, right? What value the software system brings uh, into that. And, and we have got very, very interesting uh, discussions so far regarding requirements. So here, uh, again, uh, we, can, we can use whichever uh, kind of practice, right? To, glean those requirements. We could have chosen user stories. We could, we could have chosen user cases. What we are trying to, uh, what actually wanted to think about doing here would be to use the behavior-driven development, BDD. Uh, again, I'll stick to behavior-driven development rather than that acronym, kind of the confusing of DDD. But that is what we intended to use in the form of features. So features essentially describe functionality. And how those features are being addressed could have ramifications on system architecture, the data models, and right up to the implementation. And uh, what would the behavior-driven development help us? I mean, uh, again, the natural language uh, is really encouraged to be used there, but also there are predefined keywords that could be uh, used, which helps the developer to create features directly with the customers. So, what are the states of the features alpha here? The first one is formulated. Uh, here, we are uh, articulating the needs for the proposed system via an initial feature set. Uh, next would be coherent. Now, here, we are drilling down the features. We are drilling down the features to a level of certain uh, specific details. Why? Uh, it should help us now to form a consistent view of the essential characteristics of the proposed system. Now, essential characteristics is something which can be uh, debated at length, but uh, I think it should be a select set of the uh, functional requirements as well as some of the key non-functional requirements, right, which are very, very key to the proposed system being built. Uh, moving on, the third uh, alpha is the addressed one. So, so let's say we have a whole collection, right, of feature sets. Uh, here, when we say it is, it has reached the state of addressed, is when we have addressed a, a certain set of that whole feature set to, an, to such an extent which is good enough, uh, good enough to kind of uh, satisfy the stakeholders that yes, the new system or the motivation of the new system seems to be justified. And from that, when we move to fulfilled, uh, I, I think you can kind of uh, already imagine that the entire collection of the feature system, feature set of the system should now be addressed and addressed to such a depth so that the needs for a new system should be completely satisfied. So we move on next to the, uh, to the alpha, proposed alpha for microservices. Uh, Again, it's a no-brainer. We are. This is the fundamental practice we are talking about. This is the primary alpha, and it is uh, it is uh, about the software system kernel alpha uh, uh, that we are talking about, and we are we would be talking about this from the advancing from the identification to the deployment. So again, looking into the different states, the first one is foundational. This is where we are establishing the scope of the microservice. So we have, uh, we have already leveraged domain-driven design to kind of reflect the customer's business domain into the intended application. Uh, we are trying to build up a domain model where the relevant information about the domain or the business is getting put. So this is where the uh, features are also kind of, uh, not kind of, they are, they are getting created. So that uh, repository of knowledge is coming into being and from that, when we move into the next step, which is stratified, the key, the key thing, right, the bounded context is getting formed here. And that is a potential candidate for a microservice. Now, when we are talking about DDD, a term comes up, which is called knowledge crunching. It is done to gather the domain knowledge and the structure of the business. So this domain knowledge can be scattered throughout the organi organization's business, right? And we need to probably speak to a number of stakeholders, uh, uh, domain experts, uh, uh, documents which can um, epitomize certain knowledge, et cetera, the organizational aspects. This is what we'll leverage. We'll do the application analysis and business analysis to form the bounded context. Uh, 
A bounded context uh, defines certain key characteristics. Um, fundamental would be high cohesion and low coupling. Uh, can be managed by one development team. We spoke about that. And ideally, it should have a high enough autonomy to reduce communication and coordination amongst different development teams. So now, uh, each of the established bounded contexts can be considered as a microservice. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, this is iterative. The initially, the bounded context may not be so fine grained. It can contain two or more microservices, but it should be uh, drilled down and make it fine enough so that it becomes a one is to one relationship between bounded context and microservice. Why? because it would facilitate the maintenance of the architecture through a very clean mapping between bounded context, microservice, and the development team. There should be a one is to one is to one correlation. Next up would be the choreographed one. So we have already established the bounded context, but they now needs to be choreographed to realize the intended application functionality. When we talk about microservices, this choreography is a fundamental uh, concept. Uh, what is happening here is an application would be consisting of multiple bounded contexts. Uh, each one would have its own domain model. Uh, and and uh, however, uh, see, the, the domain knowledge for a proposed system, right, or the client system, it can be huge. It can be very, very significant. Clearly, one bounded context can't do justice. They are being broken up. But there are still, however uh, high the autonomy is, there would still be interconnects between them. And there will be certain facets, right, of the model itself, which won't be modeled through a bounded context. There will be kind of like infrastructure services or certain services which are common across more than one bounded context. And that is where, uh, that is where uh, the choreography comes into being. And, and uh, this is what the contest model maps uh, about the uh, bounded contests and their relationships. And uh, I, I won't go any deeper, but this is where all the patterns of communications, et cetera, all this stuff would come. In. And then finally, the complete uh, state. So this is where, uh, so, so it is iterative in nature. The different parts of the applications are getting developed. Maybe new features are being addressed in successive cycles. And as more and more analysis happens, the models, uh, the bounded context, they are existing ones are getting impacted. Maybe new ones are getting created, right? So that refinement, creation, those things keep on going. And effectively, the microservice would get evolved to fulfill all its required interfaces with possible refinement of its structure. And that's when we say it's coming. Moving on to the third and final uh, alpha, that is the domain model. This is, this is something which is absolutely central to the domain-driven design, and we are treating it as an alpha for this practice. So uh, according to Evans, it should contain everything that is necessary to understand the domain. Now, uh, some quick backdrops. Uh, collaboration with customers are essential, right? To explore and model the domain. So uh, the first and the recurring step of DDD is knowledge crunching. And, uh, while the discussion with customers go on, the development team also does the modeling activity and uh, to create the domain model. And there is something called the ubiquitous language uh, that that kind of that is valid for the bounded context itself as well. It is also acts as the cross team language. Now, the domain model creation is very strongly influenced by exploration and experimentation. So the domain model gets. Uh, refined repeatedly and uh, as you can imagine right the, because this iterative activity gets itself aligned with the agile development processes pretty well so with that backdrop in mind uh, let's go uh, talk about the states that are there the first step the first state is initiated this is about creating the initial domain model uh, so we are aligning the customer's business model with the intended application. We are getting the requirements specified in terms of the features. And from that, an initial domain model would get created, right? Uh, possibly through a tactical diagram. Next one is the foundational uh, one where, so here we are uh, 
addressing more and more features, right, to make the domain model uh, meaningful. We are examining that domain model, and they are now structured into several bounded contexts. And as I mentioned, an application would be consisting of multiple bounded contexts, each with its own uh, domain model. And uh, the domain knowledge has to be split into those multiple domain models, and the validity of each domain model would be limited through the bounded contexts. Uh, next state would be the implementable state here. Uh, here, the context map would be getting developed as the domain model is getting even further refined. And uh, to use uh, domain-driven design terminology, uh, the strategic and tactical designs both would be completed now. The macro and micro designs would be over. And so uh, by exploring the customer's domain, the development team would by now have created the context map and the domain model, uh, both uh, the context map is integrated. And here, uh, to enable further downstream implementation, all platform specific implementation details would now be added. So which is why it is implementable, uh, as we said right now. And the final one is evolved, again, uh, in the spirit of the iterative development, uh, the model implementation, it is also evolving. Uh, specific parts of the applications are now getting tested. Some of them would be stubbed out, etc. but those stubs are being removed and actually they are being tested. Probably more and more uh, features are now getting uh, implemented into successive cycles. So as the analysis goes on, the design and implementation goes on, uh, again, the domain model potentially gets impacted along with the bounded context and context map. So this refinement goes on. Uh, uh, and the knowledge crunching process keeps on happening until it gets evolved to its final implemented implement, uh, final state. So uh, this is this is these are the alphas that we uh, that we have identified and proposed. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, ongoing uh, things that need to be done. Uh, we need to specify the work products, right? We, and as well as the associated activities uh, as, for each of these alphas. And we need to establish the interlinkages amongst all this. And uh, so this is, this is what we intend to do. Uh, as, as we mentioned that uh, from that educational perspective, uh, the method or architectural introduction, to some extent, I think this can, uh, this can fulfill the need at very uh, specifically. Semat essence is involved, right? As part of the curriculum, I think as we keep on uh, augmenting this, this can provide us with an example of how the prevalent practices can be adopted and used, and the Semat kernel can be extended to uh, to do that. So, with that premise, uh, I would like to uh, kind of take a pause here uh, and thanks uh, to everybody. Uh, for for being patient enough to hear this monologue for me, and I would uh, stop the sharing and and give it back to you and await any questions or any clarifications you need from me. Thank you. Thank you, Pata, for giving your presentation. That was quite a large one, and we already have some questions in the uh, chat. Uh, I would like to bring to the front at first. Uh, Bastian had two questions. The first one, when you introduced domain-driven design, he felt reminded uh, to DeMarco's structured analysis or Melvin Conway's how committees invent. Is that the right association there to say this is something related to that? Or is domain-driven design about, yes, about something different or something more? Yeah, so 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 how, so uh, the how committees invent, right? That was the question. Uh, is, is there an analogy to that, Dashian? Is that your question? Well, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the chat and might have might have got a bit. Uh, okay, so sorry, this was this was really when when you said okay, um, when you had your concern slide at the beginning, um, which I wish it was still there, but. You said, um, oh, um, we have some concerns, like we need to be able to break down the software. And I said, yep, 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 we, uh, 
we've understood since the 1970s that how to do that. And then, uh, then the second thing, thing you said was, um, and we need to make sure that we are having the right competencies in the right in the right teams to to structure the software accordingly. And and, and then I thought, okay, in 1968, Melvin Conway, how committees invent? Okay, you know, seems right. So, from my perspective, you 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 you, you married that into essence. Yes. So, so. Yeah, right. Uh, so when you are talking about that, how committees invent, very interestingly, this is this has got a uh, uh, strong synergy, right? And at least some of the lessons it talks about, it has got some strong synergy with the microservices practice. Now, having said that, uh, when you talk about essence, again, uh, so so I am not someone who has been into essence for long, long, unlike some of the long timers. But what I've understood, the fundamental some of the fundamental strengths of essence is it doesn't uh, preach or go by any any practice as such again it is it is something of a meta model right if you will and what it what it uh, allows us is to pick and choose practices of our own choosing which can help us here but that obviously that's not all it does right it provides certain aids to talk about certain particular facets of the practice that we are choosing, how effective are they, right? So it is providing some of its own aids and implements to kind of analyze those. And I know Bastian, you would, you would uh, I think you had your very valid questions right, in terms of the assessment and, and this stuff, and that's very key. But to my mind, when we are talking about the alpha, and again, we could kind of go in more details there. So, all these states that we are talking about, these are also uh, embellished by, you know, some of the checkpoints, right? Uh, or the, I mean, I mean, how how do I know that from one particular state it is going to another state? Uh, so, so that is one part. The other part is when we are talking about those alphas, let's also keep in mind that those alphas are not necessarily standalone. So if I am talking about a project, right, which is progressing. Ideally, I think most, if not all of those alphas would be progressing in tandem. They need to progress at a minimum to some of their states, right? To really say that this software project is really progressing. I, I would give you a very, very simple example. So let's say, let's say we are into development, right? I mean, we have done the analysis. Some of this, the stakeholders seem to be all on board, right? Very simple, great. The, the going seems to be very fine. We are very much interested in kind of implementing the requirements, whatever methodology, it doesn't matter. The key stakeholder changes. If that key stakeholder changes, the fact that we have won over all the stakeholders, right? We have, everything is uh, kind of uh, quantified in black and white, that particular facet changes, right? And that is something which is actually similar. And I'm sure it can be done in many other practices, many other methodologies, but going by that alpha, right, of having that stakeholder commitment that itself itself becomes or kind of regresses back to a more primitive one. Just to take a just to take one example. So this is this is so again, I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that this semi-essence is doing something completely out of the ordinary to change that, but it is keeping us honest, it is keeping us glued to the fundamentals there okay. and making uh, sure uh, that we are there. I'm so, sorry. Uh, I, I appreciate the things you're saying, and I think um, I, I think I'm getting. I understand what, you, what you're what you getting at. Um, what I'm wondering, what my question was about, is um, really. Um, so this seems like we something we've done before, and um, uh, you know we've decomposed things before, and we have assigned the correct talent to the subcomponents that we have structured. That's right. none of that is new stuff, and we've done this before, and that's that's great. It's always good to um, to 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 take what's to to take what's uh, what's proven. So, but then um, there are these alphas, and I'm really it irks me to say that word. It's um, we have these alphas. It's um, that um, you know then then there are like five or six or so states. Is that how you call them? Which I'm, it's not doesn't irk me quite as much, but it's still a little wonky. Um, then you have these five states, and um, when I look at them, 
they look not at all like what uh, the Marco structured analysis or anyone else's, you know, more than the Marco, right? Anyone else's structured analysis uh, criteria look like, you know, um, there's, there's no, I don't know. It's like, I was, I was, I was missing that. So it started with, here's some concerns and I'm like, okay, you know, sounds like something we are, um, we should all be concerned about and something that's proven. And then here are some states that fit to these alphas and where do they come from? So first, first up, uh, I am I'm uh, not not taking Demarco structured analysis into consideration. Ah, That's so number the one. Was no, yeah. it's the first. Okay. Yeah, okay. but okay. but no, but I am not sure. Uh, I got your last question correct. Uh, when you so it's the same is your question, question really. where, where are the alphas coming from, or why are we? Why am I picking these uh, three so, specific things as alpha? Is that the question? Yeah, kind of, and I'm I'm wondering. So so when you say okay, we're extending we're extending the same, the uh, the kernel with with these alphas and these states that pertain to the alphas. If I'm getting the terminology correctly, then I'm wondering. Okay, so um, they look they seem fine, but I'm still wondering what are the what was the motivation? What based on what data did you define that these are the ones we need? And based on what data did we know that these are the ones? These are the states that, that go in there. And then more importantly, kind of, how did we validate that these are the right ones that we, I mean, you can always start just like, oh, I'm just going to write five of them down. Here they go. And then, you know, how do we know that these were, that we were right with that? You know, how do we know that these are not false? No, I, I think it's a very fair question. I, I get that. So, so let me, let me, uh, uh, let me provide uh, our views, right? So this, these are the same questions that we were also trying to understand. Uh, so, so first up, uh, when we are talking about the different alphas, uh, there are, there are uh, so uh, Semat uh, essence kernel, there are uh, multiple kernel alphas. Two of the alphas are uh, requirements and the software system. So when we are talking about uh, these uh, three alphas, which have introduced here, first one is the feature, it is, it deals with the requirement alpha itself. And the second and third one, they are the microservice and the domain model alpha. They are uh, related to the software system alpha. Okay, so now, uh, now what is so special right about this alpha? So, so we were just trying to think about what is so fundamental, what are the fundamental stuff about the microservices uh, architecture, right? where we are using domain-driven design. We, are, we have to use both of them in conjunction. What is that we are looking at? So clearly microservices is something which is absolutely fundamental. I think it's again a no-brainer. So, so, so why it's a no-brainer? Because if the microservices, they are not progressing correctly, if that identification itself is wrong, or if uh, even if they're properly identified, their implementation is wrong, the system won't work right. right? So that way it's a no-brainer too. That is the first, first thing. Second thing again, how do I, how do I really, how do really the microservices come into me? I'm sorry, the the whole idea that this is a no-brainer. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. You know, okay, the idea okay. of correctness, right? The idea of correctness in developing a system is is a vast one. A system can be completely correct, like mathematically correct, or you can have tested it to an established correctness in one way or the other and you still built the wrong system you know that's why we differentiate between validation and verification right so um uh, i think i think some more but it's not a no-brainer i think we need brain here sorry no 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 i think th i think you're right maybe maybe i use the wrong terminology so when i'm talking about so let's let's go to uh if you think about what we are talking about is alpha so uh alpha again whatever knowledge I have, alpha is something which is which is uh, an essential right part of the uh, entire system development which needs to be tracked and and it that is essential for the system to go right. I mean if that alpha is not progressing correctly, the system will fail. So as an example, it doesn't matter that whether the requirements are being documented in a great fashion, et cetera, and the client is providing a sign off or not. I'm just trying to provide an example because they might be documented according to the 
best established principles in history and it gives on a tome of things but if somehow it uh, misses right the, uh, the fundamentals of the requirements even if they are kind of uh, implemented completely correctly even then even then the system won't be accepted so what is the learning there that something fundamental has been missed in this entire requirement exercise so that something fundamental is the requirement alpha so the question is then how do we make sure that the requirement alpha is getting addressed it's a kernel alpha so when i'm talking about again apologies if that uh, no brainer uh, sounded offending but what we what i wanted to speak about given we are talking about the practice which is an microservice architecture oriented practice so the so the success uh, would be in terms of getting the microservices identified correctly and implemented correctly and what does correctly means correctly means that they should satisfy the uh, stakeholders needs in terms of implementing the features in the right fashion okay how how that gets done is a different matter and that's a much uh, much more involved topic but what i am just trying to get an agreement here is to talk about that this microservice facet then becomes important in its own right and whether it is right whether it is that getting it correct or getting it wrong can either spell the success or the failure of the project it is that important i, I would right that's, that's exactly my point you know it's i mean i think i i understand now that you don't talk about correctness you basically largely speak about what the requirements community considers adequacy right it's like it's adequate adequate yeah. to stay to set it but that's fine it's, these are words um but you know i'm still I'm, okay I, I guess i understand why you're doing it i'm just saying you know how do we have do we have evidence that these extensions are right but i don't want to i don't want to you know capitalize the the discussion here so i think i think there are other I think what we need is evidence here and to make sure that the that these you know um no brainer choices are actually the right ones and I think you know else then okay you know I'm going to sit down in 20 minutes from now and I'm going to make an uh, an, an essence ex kernel extension for coffee cups and I say okay it needs to be yellow and green has to, has to have the word alumni in the middle and then you know I, I mean you know what I'm saying it's like there needs to be a goal and I think we need to specify that and then we we need to assess whether or not we have satisfied them, and then we can talk about the efficacy of, of a certain extension. I think that's... Perhaps we, we can uh, widen this discussion a little bit because there was another comment in the uh, chat uh, um, that asked uh, why these elements you designed in your practice were alphas and uh, why some of these might not just be work products, uh, especially for the, for the domain model. Um, so perhaps you could could elaborate on these design choices. Sure. No, and, and that's a that's a very 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 key question. This is something which we also kind of uh, try to do a lot of brainstorming. So again, uh, so when we are talking about the domain model as an alpha, so we we would have work products right? that is that is a work in progress. But the work products would there be, so so the bounded context would be a work product. The context map would be a work product because those are those are tangible uh, artifacts which are coming into being, and this though uh, and and uh, again uh, so so someone would be able to look and feel right. This is the bounded context. This is what it is talking about, and then see that translated into a microservice. We would have a context map coming up, which are kind of, and and I saw your question, Bashan, on the choreography. I'll come to that. Hopefully, in a short amount of time, quickly. That that is where the uh, bounded contexts uh, would get uh, choreographed later on, and also there would be the kind of overarching services, if you will, that would be part of the context map. So those would be the work products, right? That is how we envisage them. However, the domain model, uh, like microservices, that would be so fundamental to this practice that is the domain, uh, the microservices. Uh, based on domain driven approach it would be so fundamental to that so that we are terming it as an alpha that was our premise uh, does that answer your question uh, sorry was i was i audible yes you you were audible i 
think that uh, since it was a question from from more than one person in the chat, so nobody uh, uh, steps right. into uh, I, answer I your question. Dennis, <laughs> yeah, I could say Dennis and Bastian. I, I I think Paul is waiting to, to jump in with another question or another explanation. No, no, it's, I can jump in at any time. <laughs> but uh, just on this point, maybe to help people, uh, that distinction, why alpha versus work product, a good way to think about it is within what you're talking about, in this case, microservices practices, what are the things that are most important to progress and to keep healthy uh, to be successful. So that should be the context of what your alphas are. You know, work products are evidence of that. So the work products are not essential. They're just one way to show that you're doing it. But the essential, if you're going to call something an alpha, it's because you've, you've dictated that this is essential to the success of that practice. And so I think, you know, if you keep that clear in your head, it's easy to decide what should be the alphas and what, and what should be the work products. Now you could argue which are the, the essential things and which are the evidence of the essential things. And that's fine. People could have different views, but that's the way to think of that. That's the way to think of the distinction. That actually helped a lot. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the, the other point, going back to my previous one on you know, where Bastion was having some difficulty with this, I always like to say that keep in mind, again, that what we were trying to do with the base alphas are, are to represent things that always exist on successful projects. So what happens if you're going to create a new practice like microservices, then now you're adding something on top. Now, you, we don't have to do microservices. You could do something else. But now you're trying to define what is the important things to do microservices? And I think that's what Partha is doing here. This was always intended that people would extend the kernel because some people say, well, do we really need to extend the kernel? I would not suggest extending the kernel in terms of the OMG standard here because microservices are not required for successful projects. But we expect people to extend the base kernel in order to communicate and to help people who want to use this practice. Similarly to any other practice, you would extend it and you might add alphas or you might not have add alphas. That's, that's an option, whether you need to add them in order to help you, know, help you communicate what you're doing and to help you actually manage and monitor your success. Okay, so that, that actually helps too, because now we can say, okay, microservices, that's that's a thing we want to add. And let's say structured analysis is a thing we want to add. And we can also say, I don't know, um, uh, load balancing on, on, on service architectures is a, is a thing we can add. And and all of that sounds um, so, sounds wonderful. Absolutely. Um, so so yeah. those are just topics you, you stick on, you take some, you know, chewing gum and you stick the topic onto it. Love it. Sure. Um, that's that's you know that's that's the entire idea of extensibility and you know that CMMI also suggested but CMI is like this big and essence is like this big and I love it. So the question is now, um, of course, now that we have defined, okay, let's let's stack on this uh, this micro microservices thing, and here are the five or six things that are important about microservices. That's what you just said, Paul, right? Yep. Who says that? Who says that these are the five or six things that are important about microservices? Okay, Cor great question. Uh, That's the entire thing I've been asking the entire right, time. It's like, how do we know that those are the things that are important? So here's the first thing I'm gonna say. Uh, somebody else could come along and give you a different way to extend kernel for microservices. Now we've got two different ways to represent them. This is why I call Essence a thinking framework. It's a reference point for discussion. Who's to say which one? There isn't one valid one. In our book, by the way, we describe two different ways to look at Scrum as a single practice or a set of practices. Is one right and the other wrong? Jeff Sutherland is actually using Essence in his teaching. He does it one way. Now, you might say he does it the right way because he's one of the inventors of Scrum, 
but but you can teach Scrum different ways and be effective. I teach Scrum to my clients. I don't teach it like Jeff does. It works for me, right? So is there one perfect answer? I say no. This is, if it works for you and it works for your organization, then that's what it's about. It's about helping teams be successful. And and I completely love that philosophy in, in the sense that, you know, that's exactly what I, what I, you know, earlier I said, I shake my students trying to make them understand that, you know, um, don't wait for me to tell you what to do or how to do it, you know, find out for yourself because every project is different. And this, this is, this is just, you know, here's how you can recognize whether or not you're on the right track. On the other hand, I would argue that there are certain items, there are certain things that we, that we definitely, most certainly, absolutely, brutally, positively, correctly require some reference model for. And um, microservices might not be it, but um, if we have ever, if we ever want to have a chance of adopting um, rigorous, let's say, you know, what Tim noticed earlier, like safety or security assurance, you know, we need that. We need to be able to certifiably safely or so develop our system certifiably safely, in which case we need to have a reference model and in which case, you know, we need to have that one authority that says, this is how you do it. And no. I think, and I think one strategy of doing that is if, if Essence had some kind of method that would self-contain some method of, um, you know, this is how we do it right. Uh, this is how we have evidence that, you know, the invention that this, this thing that we tagged down to Essence works. I think that's, you know, I think it boils down to that. We need evidence to the so, efficacy. So I, two, two points to this. One is I definitely agree we need evidence it works. What still needs to be discussed further is formal certification. I, what I actually do with my clients, I, I'm using Essence on my own because I like it and it helps me, but I actually do work with companies that want to get CMMI certified. And so I do a lot of that. And so this is a certification kind of thing where we go in, we use the framework, we assess them, and we can bless them and give them a number, which is what they're looking for. We had a lot of discussion as to early on in the assessment track as to whether we wanted to go the certification route. At the time, when we decided to make it an OMG standard and we went that route, the decision was let's not go there yet. At some point, Maybe we want to put some formal certifications in. It's not there now. It was intentionally left out. We wanted people to use it. And we wanted to get some evidence that it actually worked before we went down the road of saying, okay, now do we want to certify people with this? Right. So I, I don't think that the, the word certify here, again, this is like, I think we, we keep falling over this, right? Because, you know, the word certify means something vastly different, right? CMMM certification and with the, the Federal Aviation uh, Administration will laugh at, you know, CMMS certification. They say, oh, that's cute. You don't lose money certifiably. So good for you. You know, right. when, when if you don't do what we ask you to do, then airplanes fall out of the sky like a building brick and you die. So <laughs> I think yeah. that's different level of certification here. So um you know, and I think we need like this evidence. Is I, I think we're we're agreeing on we need evidence that it works. That's definitely I'm I'm completely in agreement with that. Okay. Okay. Let's see. We have some minutes left in the session, but not very much minutes. So have we some quick additional questions to Parthar regarding your presentation? I, I think I have a one which could uh, again spark a quite extensive discussion, but per perhaps we can uh, keep it quite short because uh, you have a lot of consulting experience also in industry, Parthar. Have you used practices like that to train teams that are new to microservices or new to domain-driven designs? So if you recur back to the topic of, of our workshop, education and training, does a practice like that help to train teams to start with microservice or to start with domain-driven design? I, uh, I, I, I didn't use that uh, specific practice though, uh, Mike, but, but what we, we, have, we have done something similar, right? I mean, there are certain, uh, again, if you, if you have a certain uh, kind of, I won't say proprietary, but certain best practices related methodologies which were built 
again in my Astral company, uh, build, building on building on more generic uh, generic stuff, right? In terms of microservices, which I use, you can kind of understand that right, where I'm coming from uh, using IBM uh, tools and methodologies. And however, what I've also seen that when it came to the actual implementation, right? I mean. Uh, it, it followed that, but it also kind of took up on some uh, more pragmatic, you know, kind of uh, on the action kind of stuff of its own. That is what I've seen uh, in multiple cases. So, uh, so yes, uh, to an extent, but again, I think there have been, how do I say, I mean, uh, project specific modifications or uh, tweaking of its own, if you will, and, and kind of the architecture, uh, I would say the architectural, uh, or the contextual stuff that came in that also kind of played a part in it. Uh, so very, very quickly, the last project that I had worked on, it was uh, for an um, for a client where uh, involving logistics were also, while microservices were being used, there are lots of analytics which are also done on certain specific products. So how that interplay kind of got evolved was, was I would think, quite project specific, if you will. Well, certain fundamental stuff of microservices, obviously, that, that was that was involved. But I could see a lot of stuff playing in there. So that's how it was. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. And and Paul just wanted to uh, tell you uh, big thanks. I think you explained some of this stuff probably much better than I did. And not only for Bastion, I could <laughs> I can I kind of imagine for us as well. You definitely included me. That kind of put it much better in perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Last chance for quick questions to Partha. And if there are no more questions, I would like to conclude the third session. Thank you for your interest and your questions. Thank you to Partha. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to Bastian. Thank you to everyone taking part in the discussion. And so I think I will now hand over immediately to Joran to start the wrap up and closing ceremony of the workshop so that we can leave this room here on time. We have some time left, but I think there's no need to have another break right now. Absolutely. I, I agree that we don't need another break. <clears throat> I think we are having uh, great discussions today partly controversial, but that's, is, that is, this is what we would hope for in the workshop. Um, I think it would be pity if, if it uh, would end here uh, today and here or at the end of the week uh, when we are not every day at the Slack channel. So we uh, created uh, another activity um, where we would like to transfer these discussions uh, to I'd like to show it shortly to you. Right, I hope you can see it now. Uh, do you see the screen? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, this is uh, part of the Essence Education Forum. Uh, this is uh, something that shares uh, the objectives of this workshop, uh, encourage discussion, encourage collaboration, but has a different format. And we'd like to transfer the discussion we started today over to this uh, format um, to continue. Uh, we all agreed today that we would need more evidence, uh, more empirical research. Does it work uh, in what way and uh, to what extent? So this is uh, something we'd like to encourage. Um, and this is, uh, these are goals of the forum too. Uh, discuss and define future research needs and directions, encourage joint research. So if you are interested in more evidence and you would be able and uh, interested in joint research, uh, this is maybe one way to go to get such evidence. This is what I'd like to share in the end of, of this session and our workshop today. Um, are there other comments of you? Well, I would 
Also, uh, first of all, thank all participants for, for the very lively discussion. And uh, for me, it was quite interesting to see what happens in such a workshop if uh, people with a lot of essence experience and uh, people with literally no essence experience meet in such a workshop. And this was a quite interesting situation for, for me that we had here. And uh, it was quite interesting to, to learn a lot from the questions that were asked, because it, it helped me to uh, uh, get a lot of more understanding what are the, yeah, the, the benefits of Essence, but also the, the problems that, that people can have uh, uh, if they work with Essence. And I think that will uh, spawn a lot of interesting discussions and also research in, in further projects. So I think uh, from my perspective, this was a very valuable first international workshop. And um, I think uh, we should consider uh, having more than just one uh, at one of the next conferences and then keeping continue in this community and uh, inviting research, as you just said, you run on evidence, for example, and I think a workshop like this could be a very good place to share this evidence and to share experiences and uh, also to compare what we are doing in essence in education and training with, with other methods for essence, uh, for education and training and so on, and to, to make essence better and to improve it, uh, specifically with respect to education and training. Uh, but also uh, with, with respect to using it in industry and so on. So I think that was a really good first workshop and I hope that there will be many more workshops uh, following on this road. Good work guys, thank you much. And thanks to all contributors today, um, to all presenters who ignited the, such discussion um, and Thanks to the organizers of the conference uh, for having us today. So there's a bit time for last words. Who would like to add something? Well, this is Paul. I would add that just to reiterate what everybody's been saying, we need evidence, uh, but that there is some evidence out there. I'll, you could call it anecdotal, but I've been involved in this for 10 years now. I'm not the only one here that's been involved with 10 years. I know Michael Strever, I think he goes back close to when we started, um, which was 10 years ago, 2010 in Zurich, where the kickoff meeting was. But, but in my own use of it, with my own consulting in industry, I have written other books on this, besides the one that I've, the two that I've written with Ivar. Um, and I've blogged on this for years and written papers. And, get, and so I have a lot of case studies of my own personal experiences. We need more, but I know there are some coming. Evar is working uh, with a number of, of bigger companies because I work typically with small divisions of the big companies. And so my case studies are small team oriented, but I know he's working uh, with companies that are trying to do it on a more of an enterprise level. And so hopefully more case studies will be coming. And I know there's a lot out there if you haven't heard about it with Jeff Sutherland uh, just in the last year, using it much more and integrating it into his training. And some of the points Jeff makes, which are very similar to my own experiences, is the fact that even though Scrum is the most successful agile method out there, and there's a huge amount of people using it and including uh, agile by at scale, that evidence shows that a lot of people are not using it very well. And he's finding that he can use Essence to help communicate how to do it the, the right way, how to not make the mistakes. This is largely my own experience. I teach Scrum to, to clients as well. And what I've found is I can use Essence integrated in my Scrum training. And here's the value added. It's, it, I mean, it's easy to teach people just how to go through the motions of doing a sprint planning and doing a sprint and then doing a retrospective. And those are mechanical steps. But how do you inculcate into the team whether they're doing it well and whether something isn't working? When you go to the essence and the essence checklists and you pull those up, you can generate that discussion where, where the team gets that added insight into what it means 
to be doing it well and to be doing it correctly. That's powerful. And that's the big difference because you're not, there's a lot of teams out there using Scrum that uh, they're not being successful with it. And Jeff Sutherland has talked about this with, with all of his uh, uh, experience with it. And that's largely what I talk about. So how do we use this to help us be successful, to know when we're not being successful and how to put fixes in place? So that, that to me is a, the big exciting aspect, even more so than just describing a method, how to recognize when you're going off track and how to get back on track. So uh, I, I, I would encourage you after many years. I would encourage the um, the Essence community, and by the way, also the Scrum community, but they haven't listened for 12 years now, so um, they might as well. Uh, I think one of the things that is um, that that is necessary in order to do that is rigor. You know, we need to have more than I mean. Anecdotal evidence is fine, and frankly, much in software engineering education research is anecdotal evidence, and those are good to a degree. Um, and we also need rigor. We need we need. Ev like rigorous evidence, you know, quantitative evidence, ideally, and um, somehow the agile community is uh, escaping escaping that quite successfully, um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why some people are not not applying Scrum correctly, whatever that means. Um, and I think we have an opportunity here, right? So we identified we need evidence, and the more rigorous that will be, the easier the case will be that essence is useful. Thank you. I think time is over now. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, and let's hope that we will do more of these workshops. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's discuss, let's continue our discussion on the Slack channel and maybe head over to the Essence Education Forum if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.